defines the, rela the relations of care. And the effort to sustain those relations is the labor of care. Yet over the last decades of financialized global capitalism, the convergence of processes that include the rollout of workfare, rollback of reproductive rights, austerity measures, and criminalization of migration have denied that vital support, care, to many. In response to that denial, making lives disposable, practices we have called pirate care are organizing to help migrants survive at sea and on land, provide pregnancy terminations where those are illegal, offer health support where institutions fail, self-organized childcare where public provision does not extend to everyone, or liberate knowledge where access is denied. Crucially, all these practices share a willingness to openly disobey laws and executive orders wherever these stand in the way of safety and solidarity of humans, and politicize that disobedience to contest the status quo. That disobedience and that politicization is what defines them as pirate care for us. Our project specifically, is that Valeria? Yes, that's Valeria. Um, our project specifically aims to activate collective learning processes from the situated knowledge of these practices. To, do, to this end, we have been working on a collectively written and remixable online syllabus with the practitioners of pirate care. To do so, we have also developed a software framework called Standpoints, Standpoints that will allow us to create syllabi, as well as collections of texts that accompany them. The first round of topics in the Pirate Care syllabus were written in November during a writing retreat organized by uh, a cultural organization here, Drugomore, in Rijeka, and was launched on March 8th for the opening of Bread, Wine, Car, Security and Peace exhibition at Kunstale in Vienna. We have just opened an exhibition in Rijeka with the title Pirate Care, Learning from Disobedience. The, the syllabus itself, which is an expanding work uh, in progress, currently includes topics that converge with many concerns of health, mental health and well-being we will discuss today in this panel. We have an entire topic on psychosocial autonomy, which was written, written by uh, tonight's participants, Powers makes, Power Makes Us Sick, um, a topic that considers mental health as interdependent with social and physical health, and then sessions on psychological well-being, uh, on rescue boats, and uh, psychological judgments of debt and bad housing. The uptake is that mental well-being intersect, intersects with all aspects of care. But without going further into that, I invite the listeners to explore the syllabus at syllabus.pirate.care. While these contributions were written before the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, they resonated with a need to organize individual and mutual systems of care during the emergency and destabilized conditions of the pandemic. But also on a personal level, with the outbreak of the pandemic in Europe, we ourselves needed a way to grapple with the radical upheaval and uncertainty that the pandemic brought about in our lives. We live between Croatia, Italy, and the UK. All our public events around pirate care got canceled. The cultural and academic work was almost entirely suspended. The border quarantines uh, and closures were imposed. So the pandemic threatened the lives of uh, our parents and uh, our mates. Thus, we have rolled over our work on the syllabus into a collective note-taking effort to document the organizing of mutual aid, solidarity, and care in response to the crisis, which we have titled Flatten the Curve, Grow the Care. Um, with the participation of a broader pirate care network, we have collected and created a number of notes, instructions, and how-tos that were coming from uh, and were used by mutual aid organizers in Italy, Croatia, the UK and uh, elsewhere. Um, but I, I don't want to go further into that. Uh, maybe we should switch to our panel and you should just explore that uh, on our website. Um, our, our time is short and it was still further cut short by, by this small delay uh, due to technical difficulties. Um, so maybe more about that in, in, in uh, 
in the Q&A sessions. Uh, we have convened here uh, a group of people in the panel who we wanted to reflect on the present of unraveling of our everyday, both from personal and collective perspectives. Uh, with us today, we have Agatha Pizzik, uh, Uwe Schmidt, Francesco, Francesco Salvini or Pancho, uh, and Power Makes Us Sick. Um, Agatha, I, I apologize if I mispronounce your last name. Uh, Agatha is a critic and journalist. Okay. Uh, author of Poor But Sexy Culture Clashes in Europe, East and West. Here she will be talking on the experience of lockdown and social distancing from the perspective of social anxiety of a precarious cultural worker and in dialogue with the work of late Mark Fisher. Uwe Schmidt, um, also known under the monikers of Aton TM, Senor Coconut, an artist uh, with whose music I must admit I have personally had so many ecstatic moments since the 1990s. Um, he's calling in from Chile, uh, so good morning, Uwe. Um, and he will reflect, uh, I guess, through questions and answers through an interview format, he will reflect on the current pandemic uh, from his own situation, which from what I understand is one of home isolation, but also the political upheaval in Chile that predates the, the current pandemic. Uh, Francesco Salvini or Pancho Ramas, uh, Pancho, you correct me, what you prefer to use, um, uh, is a researcher and activist whose work lately has been largely focusing on the resonances of the mental health model developed by Franco Basaglia in Trieste in Italy. Uh, the Basilian Revolution rested on the abolition of the asylum, so the institu institutionalization of mental health, and the un understanding of psychopathology as part of the social fabric, something that in the, in the Anglo-Saxon world or context would be called anti-psychiatry. Here Pancho will talk more on those social experiments in mental health and art, particularly the work of Academia del Fol Folia. Um, and finally, we have with us also members, two members of Power Makes Us Sick, uh, a creative research project um, focusing on autonomous health care practices and networks from a feminist perspective. Um, PMS seeks to understand the ways that our mental, physical and social health is impacted by imbalances in and abuses of power. Uh, make sure to explore some of their resources uh, at their webpage, b-m-s.life. So without wasting any more time, uh, I want to pass the word to Agatha. After each presentation, we will have sort of a five minute Q&A. So uh, make sure uh, you listeners use the various channels to post your questions timely, and we'll try to pass them on to our panelists. So Agatha, please. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, I don't know, uh, probably, uh, I don't know. I'm the only one here who is who started exploring the subject of mental health because at some point I realized I had a problem myself. And uh, it's really uh, funny because um, because I, I have a feeling that it's like the last taboo uh, because uh, as a journalist and as a writer, I was tackling various uh, issues, various problems. Uh, yesterday, for instance, I was when I was listening to the very interesting panel about um, cancel culture and like and, and queer cultures, I had a feeling that uh, it would be even more difficult to come to make a uh, coming out for people uh, uh, as somebody who has health mental health issues than you know, with, uh, with, you know, coming out as gender queer or something like that. Although this is just a presumption because of so many taboos surrounding it. And um, uh, well, to, cut, to make it short, um, because you mentioned uh, issues I uh, covered in my text for the Unsound book, uh, which was about, which was uh, basically trying to answer, uh, coming out, the book is coming out uh, in November. Uh, when uh, I was trying to cover basically the experience of uh, suffering from social anxiety and borderline anxiety, uh, personality disorder in my case, while being in a lockdown uh, and being in the pandemics. And, and on the other hand, 
to to sort of refer to the work of Mark Fisher, who of course is often referred to in the context of the Unsound Festival, but also who was my sort of uh, distant friend when I was in London and whose personal struggles and um, basically theorizing about mental health were very important for me when I was coming to slow realization, I might have a problem myself. So there were two parts of it. Um, so firstly, I mean, it's funny because I think that the um, mental health issues uh, concern absolutely everybody in this pandemic. And obviously people who are, um, you know, suffering from various disorders, you know, might, might have deeper problems, but it's interesting for me uh, to hear how my so-called, uh, you know, balanced uh, friends who consider themselves perfectly normal or also sort of noted or, uh, you know, talk even online about having various personal issues. And for me, like, for instance, I suffer from social anxiety, uh, which sometimes make it for me almost impossible to function in the public space or social space. And for instance, Unsound has always been a challenge for me because while I love this music, I very often just stayed at home because I couldn't deal with <laughs> the, the sort of uh you know physical space despite of course techno is like pretty like the socially distance in itself experience although i i hope we can talk about this later on maybe and um so it's funny because for me it's always a personal struggle to sort of maintain human relationships and in the lockdown especially it has become just impossible so it was terrible because for me every day of the last uh, seven months, of course, it had various different stadiums, uh, just like mourning, I guess, first denial, then accept, slow acceptance and so on. I forgot the, the you know, which steps are which. Anyway, um, so yeah, like at the beginning, the first two months was an absolute horror for me. Because for me, every day is like a struggle, like I want to be social, I want to meet other people. And uh and this uh, winter, I decided no more of that. Like I'm really taking up more. I will be socializing more and so on. And then March and, you know, finito. And like, you just can't leave your home and you can't go to a party. You can't do anything. And I just thought that, you know, it was such a failure on so many levels. And, um, and uh, I kind of instantly realized how this is going to be that like, I'm going to probably face a serious challenge. So I don't know, I took up like everyone else, various um, various activities uh, to cope with that. But it was uh, for me, the most liberating was to realize that I don't need to, um, I don't need to try to look to the world as if I'm coping great, that this is per exactly the issue that like everyone were posting their daily routines, what they do to sort of not to like, I don't know, uh, uh, become depressed uh, in the pandemics. And I was just like, fuck that, like I'm fucked up already. Why to pretend that I'm doing great, you know? And that was very liber liberatory. And, um, uh, and so to speak, uh, you know, I kind of developed my routine and Frankly, two weeks ago, I thought that I finally caught COVID and like that, it was so horrible that, uh, you know, knowing that now, knowing that I'm healthy, is like, it feels so great that I feel like, uh, you know, <laughs> every, everything else is a non-issue. And um, so there's just so many levels. And, uh, you know, you were talking uh, about that this is a personal and, and uh, obviously a collective issue and to negotiate between the two is, 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 is difficult because for instance, I, despite being a socialist coming from a post-socialist country, you know, Poland is very neoliberal, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, now we have this far-right government, uh, of course, which is uh, very, dealing very badly with, with the COVID thing. Today we've heard we have like 500 more uh, respirators or something. So like, if we are going to have a second wave, it's going to be a disaster. Like I gave up on public social uh, healthcare uh, years ago. I mean, I stopped counting on the, the fact that the collective might help me like I don't know, I'm, I'm not insured, I have zero support uh, because the system here in Poland uh, is just too expensive. And, 
And as I mentioned to you uh, in my email, that um, the problem that I sort of realized slowly as I was realizing that I have a problem <laughs> was the fact how I organized everything in my life, my working life, my social life around my uh, illness, so to speak, around my, um, uh, you know, my way of being, which I didn't realize until a few years ago was, was an illness that, for instance, I started working from home, like I become a journalist, I've become, pub, you know, I've become, I started writing for money like 15 years ago. And like, uh, I thought, yes, I did this because I, um, I, because I wanted to be so independent, because like, blah, blah, blah. No, like, you, you know, I did this because I facing people at workplace uh, was such a hard thing for me that uh, my only office job that I had 15 years ago, I just quit after two months because I couldn't take it. And, uh, and also because the the capi late capitalist workplace is such a horrible place <laughs> that like, you know, I was just trying to do and, and slowly I realized, yes, I did. Uh, so uh, almost everything to sort of uh, prepare for the pandemics for my whole life. I've been isolating my whole life. I've been staying at home and working for home, uh, you know, my whole adult life. Uh, I've been avoiding people, <laughs> I've been avoiding people and welcomed the development of the internet uh you know very early on because that kind of saved me the anxiety of direct uh, dealing with having have to deal with people and and so on and so forth and this is not a time for this but like uh you can only imagine what kind of a frustration it is for a leftist and socialist like me who want to engage in politics and uh find it sometimes for instance unbearable to be at the demonstration because after an hour or two of noise i just have to go because I can't do it anymore because I have panic attacks. And so, yeah, this pandemic has been strange. It's sort of uh, made me look into many abnormalities of my, my own life, uh, the way I organized it. And also the sort of strange conver convergence between the gig, gig economy and, uh, and being a freelancer and, uh, you know, and, and the pandemics because uh, note how easily uh, our homes had been turned into offices of everyone. I mean, obviously it, it was a huge issue at the beginning of the pandemic because like bosses told people to come, you know, to work from home to, you know, so that, and, and, and obviously instantly you could think about how much uh, costs companies are saving themselves by moving everything, the whole infrastructure to home. Like you are paying for everything. They don't have to do that anymore, but your salary is hardly rising. Quite to the contrary, of course, people are facing mass layoffs. Like my friends are being led off every day. And um, so, uh, yeah, like I started looking critically at that and like, uh, why uh, I allowed this to happen? I mean, or maybe like Mark Fisher was saying, there is just this uh, strange compatibility between the mental mental health and uh, you know the rate the raising rates of the mental health issues and and late capitalism basically and what it's doing to us. I mean. Uh, and of course, Mark's life has written a very tragic uh, epilogue to the whole thing. Um, and, you know, in my essay, I was trying not to sort of, uh, you know, draw that line uh, that like, yes, because, you know, um, he, he was manic depressive and he was trying to organize, you know, his whole theory around, you know, how so to solve that problem. But I think it's important, uh, you know, like, um, it's one of the things that sort of, I think, legitimizes uh, mental issues that uh, are a part of our social reality, so to speak. And, and if I have some kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, political goal or, or mission, or I don't know how to call it, is to, yes, like I am very much feel the part of the movement who wants to normalize uh, mental issues. I sort of, uh, in the last few years, included uh, this subject to my writing, both uh, sort of critical and, uh, you know, more exper experimental writing. Like after I wrote Poor But Sexy, which is like more or less straightforward uh, political science book about Eastern Europe and post-communism. Uh, a few months ago, I published a memoir, uh, which is called The Girl and the Gun. It's only in Polish uh, for at the moment. and. 
and it's and it's about uh, basically uh, how how you know how I've become. I mean, it, it, you know, it sort of tells the story of of uh, my personal intellectual development and uh, how it was influenced by being sick. So, you know, and obviously I have no idea how. And actually, it's funny because this writing has been praised. Like I, since I sort of. Uh, and I'm saying this very tentatively, came out as somebody who suffers from, from mental issues, it's been really welcomed. It's like, <laughs> you know, I get more gigs. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it's really, it's at the same time, you know, it feels great, but it's kind of slightly unnerving because I really, and it's amazing, like I have no idea for how long I'm going, like just cut me any moment. Um it sort of uh, it's uh, it's another part of, of so to speak my mission is that like I don't want uh, in, you know mental health issues to become sort of packed in this kind of uh, nice package uh, for consumption that like here you have uh, you know a uh, you know young uh, young woman who seems to be okay you know she is like talking like a normal person and like she holds a career as a writer you know it cannot it, it cannot be that bad you know I don't want I'm not a spokesperson for anything I'm, I'm doing quite fine I, I've been in therapy and I'm taking anti antidepressants um, but uh, yeah I don't want this to become like a just a uh, fashionable subject like anything else because uh, because yeah like uh, you know it's it's hard and uh, a glamorous part of that are all the days in which you cannot leave the house you can't talk to anyone you feel like shit you have suicidal thoughts uh, all of this and you know and I happen to suffer from a mild version of that I don't even have you know I don't I don't have depressive episodes uh so you know um i feel like i'm occupying this uneasy space but i do sort of want uh to infect music journalism or journalism or writing uh infect with this sort of element of unbalance i love to insert personal elements and fragments into that and so to speak, uh, hoping that this is sort of normalizing uh, the situation in which you can feel shit, you can feel bad. And, you know, as a writer, of course, this informs my personality. I would be an entirely different person if I wasn't suffering from that. So uh, I just uh, want to make that visible, I guess, uh, part of my writing personality. Agatha, maybe I'm, I'm Pancho. Uh, yes. I was supposed to speak later, but maybe I will make a short uh, sure. intervention if, uh, if it's good for Tommy as well. Uh, because one of the things that, um, apart that there, there was like a, an amazing um, effect of uh, delay through, through which you were becoming blue and green now and then. Okay. And uh, it was becoming sort of a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something really, I mean, it's really spooky. And I don't know, should I switch this off? I don't know what's no, going I mean, on. It's really beautiful. I think it's really amazing. There is a ghost in the machine. What I was thinking while you were talking was um, with the Radio Fragola, Radio Fragola Gorizia, which is a radio of people that is working with, uh, uh, is people with a background of mental health uh, issues. Uh, uh, we are uh, a group, a collective in which there is people that come, which is, each one is uh, uh, is in its own world, their own world. And uh, we did uh, a number of interviews during the um, the first period of the of the pandemic uh, in March and uh, and in um, and in April. And one of the first uh, we did was with uh, uh, Act Up, Act Up Paris. ACTAP, you may know, ACTAP was the, the organization of uh, uh, activists uh, in AIDS, uh, people that were, uh, uh, they were saying we're, they were uh, living with AIDS, uh, but were not patient, were not patient uh, in the sense that they, were not, they didn't want to be uh, passive in front of the, of the situation. And one thing that uh, 
Elizabeth Le Bovici, uh, and you can find the interviews, is a short uh, piece of the interview, and she was saying, was really resonating what, what you were saying before. Mm. Uh, she was saying something that was about how you mourn with, mourn with uh, a number of practices. She was talking about uh, um, Douglas Crimp and his article, Mourning a Militants, about uh, ACTAP, and how the morning of Douglas Crimp was about swallowing cum uh, because of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the AIDS situation. Mm -hmm. so learning how to relate to another number of sensibilities, experiments with other things. And she was saying, I think, two things that are very important. One thing is about uh, being a collective and uh, thinking about this practice of uh, coming out as a practice of, uh, of connection, of alliance, of... Uh, of uh, invention, I would say. And on the other hand, of uh, she was saying something beautiful in the sense that she was saying, during the virus, during the pandemic of uh, AIDS, we were information. Uh, and this information we played in a way that was political. Uh, I think that coming from a socialist uh, political background, not a, not a state, but in the, the terms of a, a practice, a political practice, I think that the matter and what I feel very interesting in my way of coming to, to Trieste, coming, passing through a period of my life in which I've been uh, using uh, antidepressive and then not doing therapy, like you start to break the boundaries, but also you, you experiment with the boundaries uh, in a way that makes it more and more collective. So. Uh, it's this uh, this reflection of uh, Elizabeth Le Bovici was really resonating what you were saying. So I wanted mm -hmm. to add this to you because I think yeah. that would be useful to the conversation. Then maybe I will take and talk a bit. About <laughs> no, no, please do, please uh, do. I mean, it's it's interesting what you said. Like um, I I must say that this sort of uh, impossibility sometimes before the pandemic and even more right now. Uh, like um, difficulty with like uh, creating a collective or communicating with like other people who do what I do. I mean, I, for, you know, I for one, I don't feel like I, I have a community here in, in Poland. I mean, if there is a writing community, like I feel much more affinity still with my friends from London, <laughs> which I left uh, five years ago uh, because like they like, uh, speak the same language they understand the same problems and like poland's intelligentsia is like very uptight and like whatever i write in polish on my facebook that like i you know regarding my health or my feminist ideas doesn't i mean quite often meets some kind of raised eyebrows and i'm tired of that and <laughs> But yeah, like, for instance, uh, it's a very solitary ex experience, of course, writing and probably creating music as well, I can only imagine. And uh, I think what pandemic exposed uh, is that we, d um, we don't, I mean, I, it exposed to me that I don't have a community and um, it's a shame. And I, uh, I miss one and uh, that online is perhaps not going to replace it. I mean, it's fantastic to be able to talk to you right now to people who are in like, you know, um, on another side of the globe, but I feel like uh, something, is, something is missing. And of course it's because our states uh, are being dismantled for a very long time now. And our basic needs are, aren't met. Like the fact that, you know, uh, we need care uh, mental care, healthcare, whatever, and of course, in the pandemics, uh, you know, uh, not only people with mental issues, but like everyone else uh, is sidelined. And obviously, in five minutes, even people with COVID will be sidelined because there is just not enough of that stuff. And and uh, uh, since uh, Tomislav is working also like towards. Um, I mean, within maybe not national healthcare, but kind of mm. is interested in healthcare as such. Uh, it's important how uh, issues like mental health issues has been separated from healthcare because, like, uh, there's been always uh, taboo surrounding it. Uh, you know, just like I don't know, maybe sexually transmitted diseases, but in a different way. And 
And now, of course, it's like doubly sidelined because, you know, we need uh, money somewhere else. So you can't really, um, well, I was hoping that the pandemics, if anything, is going to expose the shitty neoliberal state and how it's fucking with, uh, uh, you know, national healthcare systems and like we should, you know, pay more attention to that and so on. But uh, virtually we are helpless. Like, what can we do in a moment? Beds will end in Poland and like, you know, uh, we are, we as a country, for instance, we, we are entering... Um, at another level like uh, I foresee a lockdown in two weeks and like we won't even be able to like go on the streets and protest and like whatever because like people in Poland stopped protesting for their for their social rights like dec decades ago so <laughs> you know it's a lonely task back, just to go back to something you said around healthcare might not be including uh mental well-being or mental health uh and there there is something there um i just wanted to go back to this sense of loss and denial i think that the sense of loss frequently is resting on false promises that we make ourselves you know that there are systems out there that uh, do provide i mean physical health care which is not true in many respects you no know? you can just see like who has suffered most in terms of social demographic in, in uh, the current outbreak. And you can mm -hmm. see that it always, uh, there is se separation in society and social structure and composition that just, uh, that there are disposable classes of people and they are not served. And usually they are the, the ones who provide care for others. No? So yeah. care is something that is a weird notion. It's not really a nice notion. Uh, it frequently implies asymmetry and e exclusion, in fact. Um, and with uh, mental health care, I guess the, the problem is that it's not uh, situatable in one part of life. It, of uh, it's very much contextual and, and uh, the, the world that you inhabit for friends that I have who have uh, various mental issues, for them is really difficult because they're coping mechanisms were upset. But not mm -hmm. only that, the, the entire context became social context in which they move became much more conflictual because various uh, social contradictions percolating under uh, the surface starting, started to suddenly surface. And they, they kind of couldn't hope, cope. I have a friend who kind of uh, decided to go uh, into daily uh, clinic because mm. he just couldn't manage. No. There was a question for you on YouTube. Maybe we uh, give ops. Of course, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Which was on the patterns of sleep <laughs> uh, from Cuckoo on YouTube. I'm wondering mm -hmm. how are you sleep, your sleep schedules now since the pandemic, it's been harder and harder for me to have mm. a stable schedule. Um. Well, it, it got even more difficult. I mean, uh, I mean, I decided I will be entirely honest uh, in this panel. Like, for instance, uh, I started experiencing night sweats, terrible night sweats, which hasn't uh, been there before. And I was told by my psychiatrist that it's basically that the brain switches off the serotonin coming coming from the SSRI, you know, providers, the antidepressants during your sleep. So basically all of my anxiety now is channeled to the time I sleep and I have terrible nightmares. I wake up several times. I mean, it's been, it's been worse. So visibly like during the day, like it may seem fine. Like, how are you doing in this pandemic? Oh, I'm fine. But then my, my, my sleep and my dreams are telling a different story. And Yes, it does. Like I recently started taking um, a new med, uh, which is supposed to like uh, let me sleep more deeply, so that uh, this whole thing was less terrifying. But <laughs> frankly, it's not working. It's not working very well. <laughs> so yeah, like it's this thing. Like uh, people say, oh, antidepressants are so wonderful, and of course, maybe I just have a bad set of one. I mean, I mean, maybe I should just like change my set, but I have a feeling that like even if you 
improve one part, you get you get kicked in the other, so to speak. Like during the, my days are better. It's uh, easier for me to keep a routine and like not to get like fit, fits of panic uh, panic attacks or whatever. But like my 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 nights are showing uh, the cost of that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe, question maybe. To, to you, Agata. Um, yes. Are you doing any physical exercise? Um, I walk. <laughs> okay. I'm walking. I unfortunately I can't. Uh, I mean, I'm very uh, anti yoga and stuff like and stuff like that. I used to mm -hmm. run a little bit, but because I can't. I mean, I don't want this to make all about me, but like maybe just like. Uh, yes, I tried physical routines. Yes, and I know that uh, I've been I've been told that before that um, uh, I've been basically curing my anxiety by, by long walks my whole life. So I'm just uh, walking several hours a day. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, maybe since you asked, Uwe, uh, are you doing any <laughs> physical routine? And how are you coping in the current situation? I guess. Uh, if one imagines mu music as sort of uh, part of the cultural setting, it's one that's currently fully s suspended, you no, know, like the, at least in terms of events, uh, very little can be organized, concerts and uh, parties in particular. Um, so uh, how, how is it for you in, in Chile? Well, let me uh, first of all um, say that uh, I was very um, surprised about the invitation on this topic to start with. Um, I was like, um, okay, sanity, what, uh, what did Matt think uh, <laughs> talking to me about uh, that topic? So I didn't first, in the first uh, moment, really uh, relate to it. And then I thought about it a bit more um, profoundly. And actually, um, I realized that uh, the question of sanity has always been a really, really important topic for me. Like, uh, so to me, the whole pandemic situation, um, and I have thought about it a lot during pandemic, has a lot of time to think, um, has actually not been a big change to me, nor a big surprise at the same time. So a lot of things I'm probably going to say um, are not for the very same reason, I think are not very universal. I don't think that my situation is um, easy to be generalized um, for, for various aspects I can go into a little bit later. I can um, very much relate to what, uh, what has, just, has just been said in terms of trying to unwrap, um, let's say the individual layers and the more like um, maybe layers that have to do with your close environment and the, the global layer of the problem. Um, to me, this has always been, I, I do always consider this as like one thing. I've never been really like separating what I've been doing in my, let's say daily routine or my daily life from um, yeah, what, what, I, what I've been observing in my environment or in a, on a global level. Um, to start with, I have to say, just to understand a bit better my situation uh, here in Santiago, um, 2019 was without exaggeration the worst year of my life for various reasons I don't want to go into. That they're not part of this panel, I would say. But when 2020 approached, um, I made a couple of um, New Year's um, um, wishes. And one was to uh, travel less, to play less shows, to focus on my stuff, to reduce in general, uh, like call it minimal, minimizing my, my environment. And when the uh, pandem uh, pandemics uh, happened, actually, to be quite honest, it, it was not a surprise to me. I had um, also seen this coming, not the, not the virus, of course, itself, but a sensing like a more uh, general, um, let's say systemic, I would call it systemic collapse. Um, I thought it was imminent and um, not in that type of course and not in that fashion and not on that scale. Um, so I was kind of prepared 
in 220 to uh, do less. Um, and it was, uh, of course, there it was a shock in itself, also because a couple of very close um, uh, family members of mine died uh, during the pandemic uh, of the virus within the first um, two months of the, of the um, whole event. So this made the whole experience um, I would say a really complex one as in the sense that there were like really tough emotional layers um, like placed upon the more general situation, which is like, okay, coping with a lockdown, you're closed in, um, you can't go out. You have here in Santiago, uh, there's uh, still military curfew from 10 to five in the morning. Um, so you can't go out in the morning um, in, during this time. And the lockdown was pretty, um, um, severe here in the sense as that you had to um, get online permits, um, which were at the end only two or three per week. So you had, um, you cannot even go out and walk. Um, you had to think very well with uh, which activity to spend these two or three permits, which um, in my case made it impossible to go to the studio, for example. I don't have a studio here where I, where I live. I live in a really small apartment by myself which then kind of transformed into this, uh, I, uh, funnily, I called it uh, my monastery. So uh, basically um, I was really confronted with uh, being by myself, not being able to go out uh, while at the distance uh, in Germany and um, here in Santiago, um, a couple of people were dying. I couldn't go to the funeral. I couldn't um, see these people, I just couldn't say goodbye. Um, and all this made it in the beginning a really surreal experience. Um, I have to say, and it's what I mean with um, the fact that this is not being universal, maybe. Um, I've always been somebody who um, enjoyed being alone. I, uh, to me, being alone is not a problem, it's actually a joy. Um, I, I do not miss social contact. Uh, I, I miss it to some degree, but it's not something that makes me anxious. Um, I don't have uh, social networks. I don't do that. Um, so there has not been any problem of anxiety or like um, falling back onto, I don't know, externalizing through social media or stuff like that. Also because of the, the pretty extreme um, emotional um, drain of the first couple of months due to the you know people that had died. Um, I, there was like a natural tendency to draw back and and needing to be by myself and um, just like digesting everything that had happened. Um, and at a later stage, I then started more networking, but with more like with close contacts, friends and people. Uh, family, friends, people I know, um, which has um, also in in the process of like digesting the whole thing has been very important. Um, um, on a on a more um, um, like general observation, what has always been very important to me, I've thought about this over the last couple of weeks quite quite often, has been the, in general, the importance of regulating my, I would call the input of information I receive. This has always been, I mean, the fact that I'm living in Chile back in the days, like 23 years ago, had a lot to do with it, wanting to disconnect myself from a certain type of input that I felt I was um, um, subject to living in, in Germany and Europe. And I didn't, I didn't want, um, being infiltrated by ideas. And so I it was one method to cut down this um, flow from information. And of course, over the last uh, two decades, internet has uh, developed and has come closer. Um, so now you're more and more, um, um, it's more and more difficult to cut down that um, information, select your information. And especially over the first couple of weeks of the of the COVID um, situation, 
I realized how all kinds of, call it conspiracy theories, I don't like the word very much, but all kinds of alternative ideas and theories suddenly through my very direct um, social network, not even through social media, but um, suddenly I realized that there was a whole wave of information coming. Um, um, and I realized that the world or uh, yeah, the people are starting to deal with the situation in, in those types of manners, uh, looking for alternative um, explanations and uh, since a couple of people then started to die in my life, this whole layer kind of like became really, um, it started to feel like really ridiculous in a way, like people talking about the virus is not real and somebody just, you know, died from the virus. It kind of like I felt like this um, dissociation um, in my personal environment, which um, uh, led me to really, really become I think around April, I got like really fully aware of um, what was going on. And I, I, I spent a lot of energy and time on analyzing my situation, like in a very sensitive um, fashion, like how do I feel? Um, why do I feel like that? What can I change about it? And, and I immediately um, decided to change every single detail in my life that I thought was not um, adequate um for my well-being let's say like physical or um or mental i cut uh, ties with people i thought that only delivered toxic information um i i tried to change all the routines and all the behaviors um that were because i was thrown in this new situation of where you are like locked in um, at the beginning, I think everybody knows this, uh, there was not really a routine or, or like a, a known situation at all. Everything was like different. And I realized that I kind of like settled into some um, situation, um, like the sleep hours. Uh, I couldn't do exercise normally. I go to gym like once a day. Um, so I burn more energy um, as this is one example, I realized that I had to change my metabolism um, if I want to um, feel feel well. Like I had to start eating different and less because I couldn't exercise. I couldn't go out and walk. Um, so there's so like a lot of like little things where I, over the first maybe month and a half, began to be like really conscious. Uh, like I, I really started to um, feel these things, like what happened during the day, what kind of information did I get? What kind of conversation did I have? Um, what did I eat? What did I not eat? Um, did I sleep enough or not? And in general, for example, I'm a night person. Um, I don't like days. So I, when I realized that all the midterm, long-term plans um, had folded, like I could not all the ideas I had at the beginning of the year were like not feasible anymore. I also started to think like very carefully about this in the sense as um, um, which plans do I have to let go or, or just like let them uh, push them into some other zone. And what can I really do um, in my daily um, life? Like the, the near term, like at some point I said, I can only talk about tomorrow. I cannot talk about next week. Uh, not even next month or like uh, six months ahead. So I really start to focus on this. Like, what can I do tomorrow? Uh, what can I do today? And um, started to develop um, like to-do lists and uh, routines of things I always wanted to do and I couldn't do. Like there was a lot of stuff that I had like pushed away over years, which a lot has to do with um, reflection, um, some sort of, thinking about things, uh, uh, cleaning up things, getting rid of stuff, taking decisions about things, where, which to me is always, it's very related to creative processes in general, where in order to be creative, I normally need like a space and like tune into a certain segment of thoughts and feelings and moods. And suddenly this was like the easiest thing ever. Like I realized this is great, actually. I, uh, there's no distraction. Uh, there's no restaurants, no people, um, nothing I have to do, nothing I can do. 
So I became very aware of all these subjects I wanted to think about more clearly, which I had for years accumulated. And um, so I did all that, for example. Um, I think I have the cleanest set of computers ever. Like my desktops are empty. Um, stuff like that. So I started to make order to clean up things, also clean up things with people um, and become more aware of my social network. Um, like people I hadn't spoken with, um, I, I started to get in touch with and other people that I realized they were maybe more toxic than I always thought they were. Um, I also changed, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, on a more general plane, um, like what, um, what really uh, then in conversations with people, with friends and, and family, I realized that this general contemplation about the current state is something that almost everybody was having. Like almost everybody I spoke to said to me, okay, uh, this has to change. We have to change something. Um, now I don't have to do the stuff I don't like to do. And maybe I don't want to do it ever again. Um, so a lot of stuff has happened, I think, with everybody I've spoken to. to and everybody's, of course, different and has different um, uh, conditions and, uh, and environments and, and realities. So everybody has come to maybe slightly different conclusions. Uh, one thing that though was a common thread in, in many circumstances was the fact that people were like, like what you just said, um, the idea that, okay, I'm alone, maybe I don't have a community. Um, um, I have the feeling something has to change. So what is it that has to change and how can I, how can we implement this? And as uh, victims of um, late capitalism, we are all kind of like isolated, um, we are like this broken down atomized individuals that are like at the end of some social structure. We are sitting at some end of some network at, at the end of the node and uh, contemplating to ourselves about um, all these things. And it's really hard to come to a conclusion as to what should be done. Um, and I really seriously consider what is going on a social, a social systemic failure. It's, um, it's something that it's not a small thing. It's not just the virus or it's not just a, a black person being killed in the US. I see like a, a bigger picture here. And um, a lot of people I've spoken to are willing to, but unable to come to a conclusion as to what should be done. Um, so I've, I've spoken with a lot of people about this and I've thought about this quite a lot. And um, I've um, um, investigated a lot and uh, read and um, listened to a lot of, about uh, what is called in general, the game B. So if the game A is failing uh, or has been failing or is failing, so what then is the game B? And um, then the idea of networking and community came um, uh, you know, uh, appeared. And um, I've not come to a really concrete conclusion as what, uh, maybe this panel here is one step, I thought, um, as in the sense of what, um, and this again, this may tie into the general situation here in Santiago and in Chile, which has um, had ex escalated last at the end of last year, October, November, with the social um, um, you know, manifestations here. And I would also say a social collapse on a local scale. And a lot of people, it was a big topic back then, October, November, like people on the streets, uh, military lockdown, uh, police violence, um, corrupt politicians, like I think a, a complete um, social breakdown. Um, very difficult to compare to what's the situation in Europe. It's, I think it's even more extreme than anything the current Europe um, has seen. And I've spoken to a lot of people back then, people that are on the streets and people that have been shot at, people that um, uh, were getting into you know, real problems with the police and so on as to what, what can we do about this? And it's very easy to 
um, and I don't exclude myself from that. It's very easy to look upon social structures and say, I don't know, politics have to do something. Um, economy has to do something, which is maybe yes, but uh, I've always found that very unsatisfying um, because I truly believe that oneself is the source of um, change. Like it's very easy to remain yourself and do the stuff you've always done and think the things you've always thought, but then express towards the outside world, please change, I need something different. I think this is not, uh, this is not real, this is not gonna happen. So I've taken personal change very, very important over the last year as into, as into what, uh, even, I would say even before that year, but the last year was kind of like, as if somebody had like put the gun to your head and said, okay, now, like all, all, the, all the years before, it's like a idea, social ideas, you know, what's the world you would like to have, but now suddenly it's like, um, now, now it's real. Um, well, and, yeah. well, let me interrupt. Uh, we need to sure. go on to further speakers. So maybe on this note, the relation between the personal transformation and the transformation of the social, uh, maybe uh, Pancho, you can hash out how that looks from the work you are doing or sort of uh, you're working with uh, a theater group of people, people uh, with mental illness, as far as I understand, and uh, obviously there at the center is how does the social context transform in order to help people cope, but also to resolve uh, sort of the drivers of, of their problems. So <clears throat> I, I, just, I just changed my location because uh, I'm um, working in uh, which, what was the um, mental health asylum of, of Trieste. And uh, I moved uh, out of my office, which is there, into this corridor. Uh, I moved here because uh, this was uh, the asylum. This was, uh, these were rooms of uh, one of the pavilions of uh, uh, an asylum in which uh, 1,500 1, people was detained uh, as inmates during the, the mid, uh, the first half of the, of the 20th century. Um, I moved here because uh, on uh, on the other, I would say, 30, 50, 40 meters from me, every day there is a, a, a social tailor shop, which makes uh, amazing, uh, super uh, clever uh, upcycling. And uh, Pino Rosati, which is an artist and uh, who has a, a strong disability, and when he started to have the disability built... Uh, a tailor shop where to produce uh, um, upcycling together, he always tells me uh, every night we empty this corridor, we empty the, the vetrina, we empty all the, uh, all, the, um, all the things that they sell in order to show the, the asylum again. In the night, the asylum comes back, the eco of the asylum comes back, the, uh, logic of uh, abandonment, but also of an institutional production of abandonment comes back. Um, I think it's important to be here. On, on, uh, on the other side, I'm, on the other hand, uh, is Radio Fragola. Radio Fragola is a radio. It's a radio that uh, started in the mid-80s uh, uh, as a radio of uh, uh, a free radio in the, in the early 80s, where uh, the music that... Uh, Uwe was uh, already doing, started to circulate also in, uh, in, this, uh, in this part of the world. Um, it was a place during the deinstitutionalization of, of the asylum, this became one of the most important uh, cultural uh, uh, spots of the city. Every, every week there were uh, uh, electronic music party with 3,000 people, 5,000 people. There was uh, this uh, uh, shock of uh, breaking the the individuality, the uh, loneliness of, uh, uh, of mental suffering uh, and the violence of institutional uh, uh, construction of such sufferance and to produce a new place. And what I like of what Pino tells me in uh, every morning is uh, every morning we have to build another possibility again. We have to build it together. We have to 
give back life to this empty corridor. But in the night, the fact that we uh, put everything down leaves us with the idea that if the morning after we are not again there to fight against the asylum, the asylum will come back. So why, it's, why I decided to move out of the, of the office to come here is because I think that uh, uh, there is a practice that is a practice of, uh, of the institution in producing uh, mm, mental exclusion, mental uh, sufferance exclusion. Uh, there is a, a, the practice of the, the, the matter of exclusion is a very different thing to a, a singular way of, uh, of deciding how to stay in society, in deciding uh, what is the level of anxiety or of solitude that each of us wants to take. What uh, the, the practice of, of the institution is doing is really a, a power makes us sick is a very uh, powerful uh, slogan for this and a powerful uh, place where to stand in order to uh, to propose uh, uh, a relationship with uh, with mental health. Mental health is many is the most of the time is a matter of of power, of a relation of power, a relation of conflict. And uh, what is for me the most interesting uh, and most touching part of being in Trieste is that I'm inside an experience of boundaries. Uh, between the institution and the institutionalization, so the destruction of the institution, that still try to find ways in order to make public resources, uh, social enterprises, and uh, um, a collective work to take care together of uh, uh, each singular uh, uh, fragility, vulnerability, but also energy. Because there is a lot of people that is very energetic that spends uh, its day, their day here. So um, what I wanted to, to share with you was, in a sense, this, uh, uh, this multiplication that for me comes from uh, uh, the individual. And, the, and I think both Agatha and Uwe were explaining a lot how much uh, the, the situation of the, of, the, of the pandemic in itself allowed to uh, multiply a sense, a sensibility all over, uh, all over the, the globe about uh, what we are, uh, um, what is vulnerability, what is fragility, how these things enter in our life. I think that the collective dimension of it as a double dimension, as a dimension of power, as a dimension of power, as a collective power, as an institutional power, as an organized power that produces this kind of, uh, of emptiness, of negation of life, but also the possibility of organizing, of organizing for another a counter power for another counter culture and the counter culture here has been for the very from the very first moment an alliance between uh, mm, a political take on science so psychiatry what means to be uh, a psychiatrist but to be a political psychiatry means to deny the logic of uh, inferiorness or of of diversity as a uh, uh, an exclusion, uh, a practice of exclusion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, psychiatrists here were playing a lot in order to destroy their own power. But on the other hand, it was a, a practice of arts of multiplicity coming into the space of care. So, it's not about mental health; it's about mental care. It's about care as a practice of uh, an ecological practice of living together. Uh, in this sense, uh, I'm working with. Uh, the radio, I'm working with the Academia della Follia. They wanted to, to participate with a performance uh, tonight, but unfortunately, the, uh, one, uh, there are some conflicts, as in every institution, with somebody that didn't want to share their internet connection, so we didn't manage to, to do the, the performance, but they, will, uh, they are now having dinner in the, in the theater, and they will uh, send uh, a video, and I will share it with you, and hopefully on the on the um, website of, uh, of, uh, of Unsound. I wanted to say, uh, if I have a couple of minutes, Tommy? Um, say three, four. Okay, yes. I wanted to, to try to say a couple of things. Uh, here there have been uh, uh, three utopias in a sense. The first utopia was the idea that producing a place with a a very high quality of spaces in terms of architectural uh, garden uh, would allow to, 
to defend and to, to help in the, in the mental health. This was a nine, 19th century idea of mental health. We have to save the people that is in, uh, in sufferance. And that became a practice of violence. The second uh, utopia was the Basaglia utopia in itself that was destroy this place. Let's destroy the asylum. Nowadays, this pavilion in, in, in particular is the place where social cooperatives, social enterprises, arts collective are working together. There is the most important rose garden in Europe next to my, uh, my window in order to show how multiplicity is the, and diversity is the sense of, uh, of, uh, of care and not of uh, sanity or insanity, normality or non or anormality. Um, so I think this uh, arts plays a big role in this, not as a therapy, not as a practice uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, finding a new way of being, whatever. Arts as a practice of emancipation in, in, this, in the moment in which we can produce, collaborate, and be in the world uh, together with a sense, and then and therefore to take care of, uh, of ourselves. This is what is happening in the Academia della Follia. I am very sorry you cannot see the performance because they, are, uh, they have been uh, a very important uh, theater company for many years. They have been working on uh, ballet on uh, on uh, on uh, on um, Grotowski theater, exactly for you in Poland. They're uh, one of the most important references has been the, the theater of uh, of Grotowski and the, the model of vanguard theater. So it was not the idea of producing uh, uh, a therapy through theater, a psychotherapy through theater, but of being on the on the stage, of staying in this relationship with life but being it, uh, in it uh, in a way that is sustainable within the vulnerability of, of each of us. So uh, what I think uh, is uh, for me important today is to think uh, again that this uh, possibility of building these experiments, of experimenting with uh, uh, practices of emancipation, practices of sensibility, must be a way of, uh, uh, again, as uh, as um, as Agatha was saying before, of uh, asking the state to be back with us uh, and uh, uh, experimenting with uh, uh, a new practice of social enterprise, of commonality, and of uh, uh, an ecology of care. So I see that uh, Power Makes Us Sick uh, is starting their presentation, so I will leave them the... I was just uh, testing it out because uh, we had some technical difficulties. Uh, so if you need to finish, just finish. My... No, 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 I, was, I wanted just to connect these three elements. The state is a, is a power, but also is a lot of resources, so we have to attack that. We have to take back that resources. And I think uh, we have to think practices of, uh, of commonalities and of social... Uh, uh, work together, and uh, and in that sense, I think that um, that many of the stories that uh, you can find uh, in the next uh, weeks uh, uh, in our work, and that hopefully will uh, will appear soon, uh, can be. Ciao, Valeria. Um, here is Valeria and Mate behind me. Um, uh, thank you, Pancho. Uh, maybe we now give word to PMS, and then if there is time remaining, we can maybe do a round of Q&A. Um, so, uh, Power Makes a Sick, have a screen sh share. Okay, it's on. So, uh, sort of before, or the screen is yours. Oh, well. Yes. I'll mute myself. There is a bit of noise behind me. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, wow, we've gotten through a lot. Um, and we've already said a lot about some of the ways that, you know, this global pandemic is kind of like forcing us to reconsider how, how little we actually value, you know, our health in common. Um, but we think it's also interesting um, that it brings to light, you know, not only the ways that all of our approaches are so different um, in the various places that we might be, but also how much those are very much shaped by the culture in which we live, but also 
you know, by the COVID related mandates that come from the state, right? And so even like for me or for us, right? Like moving through different parts of the US or Mexico, like I've been traveling recently and it's easy to see how much people tend to really just internalize the like regulations or lack thereof, you know, that are placed on us. Um, and it's interesting that these things become so common sense so easily in like a time of increased like insecurity and panic. Um, and we've seen that insecurity be kind of weaponized towards xenophobic ends or to cast blame and shame on those that are seen as like unclean um, in, in our society. And overall, we think that if we had a more robust understanding of the interconnectedness of our health, you know, if we focused more of our time and energy on our well-being, then perhaps we'd be more prepared when the time comes for those in power to throw so-called undesirables like under the bus for the sake of maintaining that power and control. So anyway, this is like one of the reasons that we're engaged in the work that we do. Um, ultimately, we think that if we're able to take care of one another, of our own bodies and our own minds, um, then, you know, not only would we simply be better off for it, but we wouldn't it wouldn't maybe matter so much if the state failed, if the dollar collapsed, if white supremacists pursued their dreams or like any number of catastrophes beset us. Um, and so we've already produced like a zine, like a little kind of small publication um, back in April called Physically Distant Connected by Care that, you know, kind of like outlines some of our thoughts on how to move through this pandemic and it has some of our writing and various guides and resources to cull from. And um, it also has like an excerpt from the syllabus that we put together for Pirate Care. And that can be downloaded for free um, in full on our website. So I encourage folks to, which is, uh, I think there will be a link to our website somewhere. Um, so, you know, we encourage people to check that out if you want more info about, you know, how we're approaching this pandemic. Um, but for now, we thought we would just kind of like outline a little bit who we are and a bit about what we're doing and why, and then maybe talk a little bit in more detail about what we're trying to do around autonomous emotional support and talk about uh, one specific tool that we've been working on for a number of years now called the accountability model. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, much of what we do is ultimately uh, gather together different resources around uh, autonomous health and the good news of what's happening in different places and share those uh, with people in our networks and otherwise to kind of like strengthen those ties. Um, and also we're all variously engaged in different struggles in the locations that we might be. Um, around, you know, we're all kind of like healers um, or medics um, in some capacity. And we're all sick ourselves in some way. Um, I certainly suffer from mental illness um, myself and this motivates us as well. Um, and we've also over the years done a number of different workshops to learn together with other people um, about these topics. And um, yeah, um, let's see. And I guess one more thing to just say about, you know, what we're doing. Um, so when we talk about autonomous and emotional, or sorry, it's autonomous health, right? We kind of outline mental and physical and social health and those aren't necessarily distinct um, categories but we want to outline those in full to kind of like shift potentially um, how we see health from, you know, how we see health to shift more towards that social element because, you know, the health of the social body, as, as we said, right, the pandemic makes that easy to see. The health of the social body is like intimately tied to our own well-being. And I think it would be, we would all be better off if we focused on caring for the health of the social body um, in tandem with treating the individual. And it's all too often ignored. Um, I'm gonna pass to my cohort.
All right. Hello. There are two of us here. Can can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Just wanted to make sure because it was a little late for the sound check. Anyway, so something I think that we can do while we're here. I want to share some of our tools, our concepts that we've developed for thinking about health as it relates to the structures of oppression that we exist under and just everything, a full picture of our lives as interconnected with others. When we say in our name that power makes us sick, we're, we're saying that health and illness both the experiences we have and even the way that we define those concepts can't be decontextualized from the power structures that we exist under. And I can think of relevant examples of that from the coronavirus pandemic, especially as I'm joining you from the United States right now and things are, well, you know how things are here right now. And one of the things that we've seen is just how distinctly access to care is determined by class as well as all of the racial barriers, the barriers of ableism, all of the different ways that it's put into focus who our, who our society values, who is valued most under capitalism. We also see that in who gets to quarantine, who gets to social distance and who is simultaneously considered essential yet entirely able to be sacrificed. I think that brings into focus the ways that all of the effects of power structures on our lives determine who even gets to be healthy and what's conceptualized as health in the first place. When we talk about health autonomy, we're talking about our ability to care for one another independent of capitalist institutions. Often and power structures involve barriers like I was just talking about that prevent people from being able to access care. And we're interested in the tools that we can take from that knowledge to build things outside of that that don't have, have that kind of gatekeeping. That can be everything from free clinics, street medic work at protests, the kind of sharing of resources that we try to do online and occasionally in person before a pandemic. And it's also stuff as simple as offering emotional support and advice to our friends. If you're like, whenever you're like being there for someone you care about, that is, that is a practice of health autonomy itself. And one of the things that we try to do, we've developed a bit of a focus on autonomous emotional support, like in the syllabus that we contributed to with pirate care. And one of the things we're trying to do is name those tools of health autonomy and define the practices that we use so that we can share them with others and have those resources and tools. I'm gonna pass this off. Um, okay, so um, yeah, we wanted to talk a little bit about our work on autonomous emotional support. And before we're talking about that specifically, I guess I could just say that, you know, many of us have been involved in social movements for a number of years. And, you know, from a, from a personal perspective, I think that it's interesting that there's been a lot of emphasis uh, within radical communities to, you know, train and skill up on say like street medic support and having like um, the skills to treat certain types of injuries and wounds. Um, and yet, you know, when you're confronted with state repression and you're fighting, you know, whatever kind of various forces of oppression and domination um, that you might encounter in your world. Um, there's, there's a, you know, a lot of psychological warfare that is at play um, within that as well. And we, we kind of saw, at least I've seen a lot of people, some of the mo some of those who are, you know, maybe doing the bulk of that kind of like care work um, and trauma support be ostracized and you know 
um, kind of like not tended to and therefore isolated from those social movements. And it's really sad. Um, and I mean, I've seen that happen also like on a very personal level. And so I guess for us, it's like important to kind of like um, emphasize like emotional support kind of like on par with the other kinds of um, tools that people might be bringing to those movements um, and train up and skill up to just have like a better set of baseline practices and models for how to do that. And that's a big part of what we've done. And that's something that we've done more like on the ground, um, like in the US and also in France a bit and in the UK. And so we kind of like have been able to learn by doing you know, through what's worked and what hasn't worked. And also we've been able to draw upon like a huge wealth of resources um, from others who have tried to do the same thing in the past. A lot of that knowledge has been forgotten. And so we're just trying to like, you know, bring it back into focus. Um, and let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna pass off again. All right, I can go ahead. Something that I think has already been touched on in the conversation today that I was glad to hear brought into focus is the way that the social distancing during the pandemic has, and I think this was referenced in the, around some of the conversation in the beginning, the way there's been kind of this focus on self-care and productivity that has gotten to an almost absurd point. How do we feel like there's almost more pressure if we're quarantining or isolating to be productive and have a thing to show for it? And one of the big things that motivates our work around naming practices of emotional support is the way that the emphasis on productivity gets translated into, it's translated fairly uncritically into radical spaces that instead of productivity for capitalism, it's defined as productivity for the movement, which in many ways puts just as much stress on people who are sick in any kind of way, struggling with mental health. And a lot of our work has been around creating tools to identify and record these strategies that we develop to support one another. And one of those that we're about to talk about is the accountability model. Before we get into that, I want to preface that with the word, how we think about accountability. Accountability can mean a lot of different things in radical spaces. And I think we most often see it brought up only in relation to interpersonal harm as the responsibility we have to one another only comes into play when that responsibility has been let down or violated. And so to kind of counter that tendency, I think that's, and take a broader view of what care would look like we try to conceptualize accountability as an ongoing practice of care, of recognizing the mutual responsibility that we enter into when we care for one another, kind of like the building blocks, the material that care, that mutual care is made of, rather than something that only comes into play if someone has harmed someone else. And we're going to elaborate on that more in a moment, but if we're talking about like our own mental health, how we've been managing in the pandemic. I'm gonna say that a lot of our research process is just like doing these things in our personal lives and seeing how it goes. And I'm always still gonna be working on putting these principles into practice. And that is that is just part of the process here. And I think my friend is going to, here is going to talk about the accountability model. I'll pass this on. Okay. Yeah, also before that, uh, which is the last mm -hmm. thing we wanted to talk about, I guess I should just say too that one thing I um, wanted to mention or just bring up when other people were speaking is that one of our mottos, uh, our slogans is action dries your tears. Um, and I think that that's a good way to summarize the fact that, you know, for a lot of people, um, it can get really easy or it, it it's also just like too easy to get caught up in the how overwhelming 
the state of things might be, um, especially if you're struggling with any kind of mental illness. And um, I don't know, I just wanna put that out there that finding ways to fight back is sometimes one of the most therapeutic things you can do. And sometimes one of the only things that some people might have access to. Um, and so, yeah. So the accountability model, um, it's essentially, it's an experimental model for supporting and taking care of one another's mental and physical and social health that involves developing small groups to work together to research op options, identify and build community resources around healthcare and implement and support that. Um, so those seeking and offering care are fully aware of and consenting to. Um, and it can be adapted in a holistic sense, or it can also operate, which it most likely would in this case, in, in you know, where we're at right now, as a transitional step towards caring for one another independent of the state and capital um, while still operating through those systems. Um, and so we wanted to develop this tool um, because for us, we, when we were first starting out, many of us were migrants um, and also doing work alongside migrants who were in just like a tougher spot than we were obviously, you know. Um, and we wanted to find something that could be an autonomous sort of like framework that could work in the in the instance that one might not have like a fixed location or a fixed clinic that one could go to. Um, and so we drew inspiration from a lot of different projects like uh, from the Icarus project for sure. Um, and a lot of other um, projects that were trying to do something similar. Um, but we made, we drew a lot of our inspiration from uh, the health, the, sorry, the autonomous clinic in Thessaloniki they have um, a group for alternative medicine that attempted to re-envision how they could offer healthcare to largely to migrants um, in the area. And it, for them, they have um, a sort of like two hour long thorough intake process with folks that with, with a doctor and a psychiatrist and a, someone from that person's like social network or you know community who all meet together and speak about, um, all, they ask all the questions that might pertain to one's health, but maybe it's slightly more expanded than what you might have when you do a typical intake with a doctor. So it also asks questions about, you know, your working conditions, your living conditions, um, try to, and your, you know, your family history, your relationships with your family and friends to kind of like unpack all the different things that might be impacting your well-being. And so what happens in that case is that some of the prescriptions end up looking less like, you know, here, take this pill to treat this ailment, but instead, okay, you're living in this building that has mold. These other people are also, that are coming to us are also suffering from respiratory conditions, right? So why don't all of you come together and put pressure on your landlord to, or the, the property owner to get rid of the mold, right? So like those kinds of prescriptions become something that happens when you open up that space of health to include the social element as well. Um, and so we were really inspired by them for various reasons. Um, and yeah, so our model as it stands now is kind of like, you can find it online if you're interested in more information, but essentially it's a, a sort of thorough intake questionnaire that you could do with your own group. Um, say someone who is, in your network, so is going to be like loosely responsible for your physical health, and someone who is loosely responsible for your emotional health and your social, and then someone else for your social health, and you all kind of talk together about um, everything that might be going on to make a plan of attack um, that is going to be really dependent on each individual person, um, and basically like have regular check-ins that you're all consenting to. Um, and ways that you, you know, each individual person can be reached or when and how you can be reached um, to follow through with that plan and you can follow up on a regular basis. So it's also not just um, a way to re-envision how that care can operate, but it's also sort of like a way to formalize um, or concretize like those kind of uh, informal 
conversations and informal forms of support that might already be happening and just kind of like track them and recognize them as such um, and give more credence and weight to them. Because yeah, right, a lot of the reason that we are still so reliant on state-based, you know, public health care systems is ultimately what we've found from, you know, following up with like a lot of solidarity clinics and people who are doing these things in a more independent fashion is that people are just going there for the, for the confidence of it, right? Like for the sake of someone that you have entrusted with that uh, knowledge to tell you that you're okay or not, right? And so I think shifting that trust away from like state-based institutions and capitalist ones into the hands of ourselves and our comrades and friends is like uh, one step towards um, yeah, maybe maybe doing that in a more holistic sense in the future. Um, and I think with that, um, so this is an image of the, one of the pharmacies in Thessaloniki. This is some of the accountability model. Yeah, I think with that, we'll just close and open for questions. Yeah, thanks. Tommy, are you muted? <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I, I need to leave, but if there are maybe questions or um, any last words from people here, I want to personally thank you all, uh, Agata, Uwe, um, Pancho, and you guys, Power Makes Us Sick. Um, and I hope, unfortunately, this had this is running late, so uh, we didn't have enough time maybe to talk it through, but thank you for uh, sticking with it. And, and um, yeah, bye everyone. Yes, I will also have to, to leave uh, in five minutes or I will be closed in the, in the pavilion for all night, but, so I will uh, leave you now. And uh, thank you, Agatha Uwe and um, Powers Make Us Sick for, uh, for the very interesting thoughts. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I don't yeah. know. I want to thank you all too. And mm -hmm. uh, especially to Uwe, I found what you said very uh, touching and uh, my sincere condolences to you as well. And I don't know, uh, I'll be thinking mm -hmm. about what you said a lot. and just this, this sort of negotiating between the personal pain and personal space and just doing something collectively or in private. Uh, well, you know, I'm not expecting that the state is like going to solve all of our problems, but uh, I, I only wanted to sort of uh, uh, stress how, you know, what we are experiencing on a personal and collective level is also, you know, a result of a very long sort of dissolution of the state, so to speak, of, of the social state and, and uh, the, you know, its functions. And like, if we had this pandemic in the 70s, in the heyday of the social, social democracy, or, you know, I, that would be uh, without doubt better managed than, than today. And yeah, well, but obviously I have no solution. So just, but to, thanks uh, to everyone uh, for a lot of food for thought. And uh, I don't know, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, what can I say? Like, uh, take care <laughs> in, in this, in this uh, situation we are all in. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. We also have to leave in a moment. Thank you. Everybody.
Last January, my sleep cycles became suddenly and inexplicably broken. I averaged three hours of sleep each night for several months straight. I tried melatonin, limited screen time, paste, read monotonous books, and listened to podcasts designed to bore you to sleep. I became an expert on white noise machines, exercised relentlessly, new sheets, new pajamas, lavender sachets, long baths, sleepy time tea, CBD, no caffeine, no sugar, no nothing. I'm no dream operator. And like the know-nothing results of self-treatment, no doctor could seem to offer answers. When people asked me how I felt, I said like a raw nerve swimming through soup. My nights would unravel into unruly branching research patterns. I sought resonance with fragments buried in the deepest corners of the internet. Depending on how slurred the hour had become, a single thought could echo into rings of afterthoughts that seemed logical in the moment, but unhinged by morning. Flopping around, fighting with my pillow, I would think about how the incredible melting man wasn't about a Saturn-born virus, but transient psychic decay. In the wake of the melting man's liquefying shuffle, he weirded the landscape until he just wasn't anymore. I would find images of business bros with awake eyes painted on their eyelids, sunglasses shaped like a hammock of interwoven fingers, anthropomorphic food from the 1970s, Bigfoot chainsaw art, roadside ice cream shacks shaped like owls, owls hunting humans, people dressed in ear costumes, the old box over the head with knives through it magic trick, radar installations, White snakeskin purses shaped like rotary telephones, calling in, ringing in. Coral-encrusted Garfield telephones on top of fish tank televisions. Staticky VHS footage of Detroit horror hosts smashing fake rubber frogs. Count Scary in a Thunderbird cruising the city in the dark, attached to the back of a tow truck. This is fine, I decided. It's all on fire and the pixels are smeared. But this is fine. I was dipping in and out of the swells when a charged-seeming dream descended. Barefoot in the shallows of a stream with a prickle of gravel underfoot. The water, icy cold. Drips of sound arpeggiated toward a waterfall falling over itself in slow motion. Bending down to pick up a rock from the stream bed, the rubble transformed into a stone shaped like a flower as it breached the surface of the water. It was a pleasant trick at first, but as each stone was cast aside and each new one plucked out, it would always emerge as a bloom. The heads of violets and coneflower, trillium and cowslip. It turned stressful, all of those stones operating on their own dream logic. The rising sound of a steam whistle intensified behind me. In my periphery, I became aware of a watery woman coming up from behind the waterfall just as I dredged myself out of the dream. I woke with the impression that she wanted to send me on a metaphysical detour. The thing is, I identify as Native American. I'm Métis. I'm part Anishinaabe. Pulling back the layers of my family tree, my grandparents have names like Chief Nicholas Arundaki of the Bear Clan, Jean Otrohoendat, and Kateri Anenentak, who is called Belle Fleur de Bois, or Beautiful Flower of the Woods. They are the original Métis names of Durand and variations on Cadeau. Voyageurs and Courier de Bois who helped the French settle Detroit. Other cousins were Chief White Crane, Bad Pelican, and Chief Sharpened Stone. 
Our ancestral ties went direct and deep into Wendat and Ojibwe history, but a decision was made by my grandparents to obfuscate our lineage. We became French-Canadian farmers without Indigenous roots. I feel a kinship with the Toni Morrison quote, when you kill the ancestor, you kill yourself. But in the mode of positive recovery, I also think of Tommy Orange writing, you should never not tell your stories. Huge swaths of my lineage were victims of willful silence, but growing up, I would overhear my brown-skinned, black-haired uncles whispering about a knowing in the bones and a feeling in the blood. I knew that feeling too. Until the 1990s, our family tree met a hard stop at my great-great-grandparents, who seemed to sprout up from nowhere on a rural Ontario popcorn farm. The day my mother released the weight of 200 years of secrecy, we were driving on the dusty country road leading into my hometown, cornfields to the side. Maybe her sudden pragmatism was provoked by the brain-numbing effect of the heat wave. So, she said, it turns out we're all Indians on your grandfather's side of the family. A croak of reckoning from my throat. The feeling of being mating is often described as being a process of constant becoming. A few years before, my uncle had formed a connection with the tribal elders on the First Nations reservation that bordered our town. He became more vocal about our ancestry, but my family dismissed him as an unreliable narrator, especially after that time he took LSD and came home bloody, claiming he was a wolf. And what about that time he went outside for a smoke break at the factory, claiming he saw some friggin' spirits and angels dancing up there in the stars? After the evaporating impression of a woman reached out to me through the mist of a dream, I discovered a connection between my ancestors and the surreal partial reality of the story of the little flower girl. The story takes place in northern Wisconsin in the 1850s, with two white men and their Métis guide staring through a pool of shallow water at a petrified woman, who they soon discover is Wabagunquas, the little flower girl. But there's more here. Wabagunquas is the likely fictional cousin of my very real cousin, Madeline Ikwesewe Kado, daughter of Chief White Crane. The Crane Clan totem metaphor is Echo Maker. This legend unfolds in The Woman in Stone, a novel written in 1903 by Harriet Wheeler, the wife of a missionary. Great reducers of indigenous tradition, the Wheelers encouraged the swapping out of Kitchen Manadu for the Christian gods. Her book opens in the mid-1700s with the character Claude Lachesse, who begins a secret romance with the little flower girl, who in turn is promised to another member of her tribe named Eagle Eyes. Eagle Eyes discovers Claude's designs for his fiancée and kills him. Wabagunquas is traumatized and tells her cousin, I had a vision at night and I beheld the monsters of the deep dragging me down. They clasp me in bars of stone, and I lay there forever. Eventually, she comes to terms with Claude's death, and disappears one night in a canoe, never to return. The last chapter of Wheeler's book jumps ahead to the 1850s, with the little flower girl's homelands colonized. This is the age of steam, and far and near echoes the steam whistle. The men stand over her petrified body, she was driven mad by the loss of her pale-faced lover, Wheeler wrote, as though it was one of the men speaking. How came she by this cross? As if she had no right to the rosary around her neck. Evidently, she was a good Catholic, in defense. A touching romance, worthy to be involved in stone. A question of removal, in secret. Her life belongs to the public. Our great city will be better for this monument of her romantic, tragic, sorrowing life. It was decided. 
Her body was taken back to New York City, where it was supposedly sold as a curiosity to P.T. Barnum for his museum. In 1865, Barnum's American Museum caught fire in a spectacular way. Crowds gathered to gawk as firemen dipped in and out of the inferno, saving relics and curiosities. As the third floor became cinders, the stone corpse of my cousin, assuming she existed at all, would have smoldered alongside another famous petrification. A horse wrapped up in an enormous boa constrictor, which was about to attack its human rider. Curiously, there is a record of a petrified piece of pork recovered from the water after 60 years, but no mention of the stolen body of a fossilized woman from Wisconsin. Stories of humans turned to stone go much deeper than the pilfering of the little flower girl's probably non-existent body in Wisconsin. Similarly, the legend of the Belle Isle snake goddess oscillates between half-truth and full folklore. Belle Isle is a small island in the Detroit River, nestled between the United States and Canada. It began its life as Wanabezi, Swan Island, and was used by Anishinaabeg tribes before it was colonized by the French. There are several versions of the snake goddess legend, but it always begins with the same problem. Chief Sleeping Bear has a daughter that is so beautiful, he decides to hide her by placing her in a covered canoe and floating her out into the middle of the Detroit River. The nameless daughter remains silent in all variants of this story. A man sees her and kidnaps her, but the personified winds want to possess the maiden for themselves, so they blow him over, killing him. The winds accidentally smash the canoe of Sleeping Bear's daughter, and the bark floats downstream to form Belle Isle. Manitou, the great spirit, transports the daughter to the island and surrounds it with a girdle of vicious snakes to end all contests over men and deities over her beauty. The transformative lineage of Belle Isle's name reflects the introduction of invasive animal species and colonization. At some point, it became Rattlesnake Island to reflect the story of Sleeping Bear's daughter. In the 1760s, the French named it Ile aux Cochons after staking their claim and importing wild hogs to deal with the snake infestation. In 1845, the annihilation of the site's indigenous connection to the past continued after it was renamed Belle Isle in honor of Isabel Cass, the daughter of Louis Cass, a Michigan politician and slave owner. Lewis Cass forced Michigan tribes to cede vast amounts of their land, pushing them west of the Mississippi River. He once wrote of the local Anishinaabeg as a barbarous people who cannot live in contact with a civilized community. There's a second tier to the snake goddess legend. In the spring of 1670, two French priests named Francois Dolia de Casson and René Brehant de Galinet arrive in Detroit's unsettled lands. Docking at Belle Isle, they're amazed by the hushed and abundant nature, but the silence is broken by their indignant gasps when they find a rude stone idol in a clearing. It was a crude production of nature, created by her in a fit of abstraction. On the rock, vermilion pigment amplified its face-like features. It was worshipped as a representation of Manitou. Dolia and Galinet were vexed, seeing only heathen idolatry, and smashed the stone Manitou to bits. In Galinet's journal, he claims, I consecrated one of my axes to break this god of stone. The missionaries raised a stone cross in its place, claiming ownership over the unoccupied land for France, and dumped the largest pieces of the statue into the middle of the Detroit River so it couldn't be reassembled. The missionary's account stops there, but the story continues. 
Manitou sends out a distress signal, asking his followers to gather his remaining fragments and drop them into the river, where the deity has taken refuge. The smashed statue's energy was set loose like a mushroom cloud, triggering action by the faithful. In one version, the stone fragments of Manitou shed their grit, transforming into rattlesnakes, which become the sentinels to guard the sacredness of his domain from the profaning foot of the white man. In another telling, the stones united and became a monster serpent. Ten years later, the French explorer Robert Cavalier de La Salle, the original backer of Dolia and Galanet's expedition through Detroit, came through on his ship, the Griffin. As they neared Detroit, the Anishinaabeg mobilized to the shore and invoked Manitou, while strange forms arose from the water that pushed the ship into the north, her crew vainly singing the hymns with the hope of staying the demoniac power. Shortly after, on that same voyage, the Griffin disappeared under mysterious circumstances and became the first shipwreck to find the bottom of a great lake. Shards of the Griffin dispersed, mirroring both the smashed Manitou idol at Belle Isle and the canoe of Sleeping Bear's daughter. While he may not always be named directly, Manitou remained a presence in Detroit legends for his ability to create echo-making effects on canals and rivers around Belle Isle. Canoers and kayakers make a game of hearing their words ricochet back as reverberations against bridges and shorelines. People in the 1880s talked about how they lazily float on the moonlit waters of the Detroit River and amuse themselves in awakening the angry spirit of the Indian god Manitou as they test the echoes of Belle Isle. In spring of 2020, Belle Isle became a refuge for Detroiters looking to escape the mundanity of their coronavirus self-quarantines. Even on its busiest days, the island has a kind of emptiness and uncontainable eeriness that would do Mark Fisher proud. These moments are amplified by the what comes next paranoia attached to COVID-19's recent ascent. Since the lockdown began, I've had time to think about the strange network of interlocking stories that deal with stone, grain, and ash, active states of matter that dissolve and reform, alternating between visibility and invisibility, colonization and resistance. All the while, these agents transmute outward into culture through the contagion effects of folklore. Their detour is rife with an agency that provide clues to shatter restrictions on bodies, on belief, and on ancestral rites of knowing. At times it can feel like the world is flipped, that the most absurd and desperate of my insomniac internet searching views have overtaken the real world with the same giddy logic, the same sense of untime. On Belle Isle, there's an old picnic shelter covered with a rotten tarp with strands that billow out like ghost fingers in the wind. A derelict zoo, confusingly designed with a nod to Polynesian architecture, overtaken by nature and graffiti writers in the early 2000s. And there are new detours to consider this year. Flooded roads blocked off with concrete barriers leading into the swampy stands of trees. There are no park employees to shore up the rising waters. Uncut grass turned to fallow fields. A gigantic glass conservatory, normally a hive of chlorophyll seekers in the winter, closed. Caches of party trash and styrofoam coolers that park workers refuse to collect out of fear of infection. The island is looking less than Bell this year. On June 5th, 2020, a crowd emerged from lockdown to protest the murder of George Floyd marching across the MacArthur Bridge leading to Belle Isle. The protest was silent, though participants vibrated with outrage. Arms linked, no shouts, no violence. In June 1943, one of Detroit's many historic race riots erupted on that same bridge, ending with the deaths of 25 African Americans, who were mostly shot by police and federal troops. 
Daily protests in Detroit continue at the time of this writing. In late August, bells rang and echoed through the city of Detroit. A memorial composed of a spine of hundreds of family photographs of Detroiters lost to COVID snaked through the roads set six feet apart. The virus lockdown here in the UK happened around mid-March and certainly for myself, but I'm sure like, like many of us, I was first really frustrated about the constraints because normally I think we, you know, we travel widely and so that, that became a real challenge. But I started really to turn inwards and discover what was on my own doorstep or here what's on my, in my own back garden because here where we are, northeast of England, 55 degrees north, March coincided with the beginning of the urban dawn chorus, bird song, and the arrival of spring. But when I started to hear that, I was really heartened by it and turned my microphones into my back garden, rather, to the wider world, and really started to rediscover what was on my own doorstep. I think one of the few advantages of being locked down by the coronavirus was the disappearance of noise, certainly for us in urban areas. Traffic noise all but ceased. Aircraft noise disappeared almost overnight and we were entering this very different acoustic environment. And that meant, I think for many of us, we started to hear more and then eventually tune in and listen. A blackbird took up a residency here in our suburban garden and from early March began to sing to defend this territory and to advertise for a mate. And all this started to happen 10 metres above my head at the top of this cypress tree. During the nesting season, birds are territorial and blackbirds will defend their patch by song. They'll regularly sing from prominent positions around the periphery of their territory. And the top of our cypress tree was a real favorite. It's always good before you start recording to look and listen, try to identify sites such as these because they're very rewarding in that the bird will return here on a regular basis, sometimes every 20 or 30 minutes. So it becomes a very reliable source of sound. Because this song post was so reliable, I wanted to experiment with a range of different microphone techniques. So first of all, I chose this, one of my favorite stereo arrays. It's a pair of cardioid microphones spaced 17 centimeters apart and angled away from each other at 110 degrees. It's called ORTF after Radio France, who devised this technique in the 1960s. And I really like the sound of recordings made using this system. The challenge was now getting this microphone array and a windshield up 
as close as I could to the singing blackbird. These telescopic microphone poles are most often used on film sets for suspending microphones over actors when recording dialogue. I like to use them for getting my microphones into otherwise inaccessible positions. In this case, up into the branches of this old apple tree, which is adjacent to the cypress tree where the blackbird song post is. And so using this technique, I can extend the microphone within about three or four meters, I think, of where the blackbird was singing. Once in position, I can then run a long cable back inside the house so that avoids creating any disturbance when I'm recording. And I can also record in comfort. There is no point being uncomfortable. I rigged the mics out here one evening and left them in position over several days. This is my ORTF recording of the blackbird singing here at 4 a.m. in mid-March. The mic array produces a really good wide-angle stereo ambience of the dawn chorus with the blackbird singing center stage. Now, when I listened back to that recording, it became clear to my ears that because of the lack of noise pollution from traffic and aircraft, I could hear all the other surrounding blackbirds in different territories. 
Now, if I could hear them, then certainly the male in our garden would be able to clearly hear its potential rivals. And I think that's one reason why a lot of people in urban areas during lockdown reported being able to hear songs of different birds more clearly and more loudly. It's not because they perhaps sing more loudly. I think birds have been singing more vigorously. Certainly the male blackbird in our garden has been singing more vigorously because it was all of a sudden aware of its potential rivals in surrounding gardens. And so it was singing more loudly to defend its territory. And of course, the females would also be listening. So it's quite likely that the female in this garden might quite fancy the song of the bird over the fence or down the road. And she would go over there and mate with that bird and perhaps several other rival blackbirds in the area, which of course is very good because it strengthens the gene pool. So all in all, it's been a really good season during lockdown for blackbirds and I guess most other birds. Now, because I was in isolation, I came up with this idea of wanting to isolate the song of that blackbird. And that required a different microphone array. So I chose this, a middle and side arrangement with a forward facing gun microphone. And I used this system, just the forward facing gun microphone, to isolate this blackbird's solo. This is my gun mic recording of the Blackbird solo at 4.30 in early May. This became the first part of my track unlocked for the Unsound Intermission album. As soon as we were unlocked, we came here to Dunstanborough Castle on the coast of Northumberland, one of my favorite recording locations. The castle was built around 800 years ago, but the rocks, the foundation upon which Dunstanborough Castle sits are much, much older. They're part of the Great Wynn Sill, a layer of volcanic rock which was pushed to the surface here, right on the coast, almost 
hundred million years ago. It's these rocks, this part of the Great Wind Sill, which form the foundations for a Dunstanborough Castle, and they're clearly formidable defences. But these cliffs are also home to a large community of seabirds, and it's their voices that I came here to record. For the first part of my track unlocked for the Unsound Intermission album, I focused on the solo voice of a blackbird in my garden. Here, in contrast, I wanted to record this community of seabirds, many of them calling in flight and moving on and off the cliffs. And there's one bird here on these cliffs with a very special voice, a kittiwake. It's a white seagull with jet black wingtips. In English, kittiwakes are onomatopoeic and they fly on and off the cliff ledges here at Dunstanborough calling their name. To record these seabirds in this very special acoustic, I chose this particular mic array. I'll take the windshield off. This is a double mid side arrangement, recording on three channels, and it records a 360 horizontal sound field, which I can decode to stereo and choose the width in post-production. It's perfect for this kind of location where you perhaps need to vary the stereo angle or even focus in to a particular part of the sound field. And I'm going to point it over towards the sea cliffs. In order to record these kittiwakes within their sea cliff acoustic, the mics are backed off considerably from the source of the sound on the cliff ledges in order to soak up all the reverberation and sounds of the sea wash, because they really are the signature sounds of this place. The air is full of their plaintive calls. And local stories say that pity wakes are the souls of children who drowned at sea.
Hi, uh, my name is Dave Tompkins. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be here as part of Unsound Intermission and joined by Kristen Gallino and Chris Watson. And hopefully you just <clears throat> had a chance to see their two films screened earlier, stream, screen streamed earlier. And, um, and yeah, we're just gonna talk about their work process. And I should apologize in advance. Uh, there's been some construction down the street and we may be joined by a power driver occasionally. My room has been wavering all day. Nice. So if I drop out of the screen, then um, I trust you, you guys can carry it on. Um, but just a quick introduction, in case for those who aren't familiar with, with both, both artists. Um, Kristen is a, I would say a sonic folklorist, a brilliant writer. She's the uh, author of one of my favorite books, uh, High Static Dead Lines. Uh, she's a curator of communications information technology at the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and she also, she's in charge of a lot of like crazy historic te te technology collections. And uh, this does not include the uh, script of The Incredible Melting Man, the only copy of the script existing in the world. <clears throat> and Chris Watson is a field recorder. He's contributed to numerous BBC programs. You've definitely probably heard his work uh, behind the scenes. And um, he's also worked on this incredible uh, elephant infrasonics project, uh, collaborating with uh, Carlos Casas and um, Tony Mayat, um, the film Sanctuary. He's done several hydrophonic explorations with Jana Wendren, another uh, unsound participant in the past. And I also highly recommend his uh, Ocean Noise Pollution podcast, uh, Oceans of Noise, that um, The Guardian ran uh, last year. And I think I should add that the first time I met Chris was in a uh, mausoleum in Oslo. Had, uh, <laughs> and it's like a reverb preserve. Um, but anyway, welcome you both. And uh, thanks for the work, first of all. I mean, both, both films were I really enjoyed them and had me thinking and rethinking. And um, I figured like we just start with sleep patterns because we we're just discussing this briefly <clears throat> before we went live. And uh, Kristen had a dream about cicadas uh, and borrowing some of your equipment <laughs> in the dream. And, um, cic and the cicadas appear in her at the very end of her film as well. Yeah, I love that. Well, I love, I think throughout Kristen's film, even from the opening, bars that that um those super sort of high frequency very musical warbles that is what immediately drew me in before i heard Kristen's voice and then the narrative element of that really took over but that's one of the things i wanted to ask you Kristen. that that very start that introductory passage on the soundtrack the, the this to me the sort of sound like birds, but they also there's a, there's a strangeness to them as well. How, how did that happen? Yeah, so I was actually piecing together. So I guess I should backtrack and say this started as an essay for the Unsound Intermission book. And it's funny because it was supposed to be 2000 words and it blossomed out into 10,000 words. And then I had to draw it back down to like, well, 2,500 words. <laughs> so, um, and then the film came after that and based out of that sort of narrative. But as I was sort of piecing together the visuals for the film, um, the, the soundtrack is very much this sort of like rise and fall through the different seasons of quarantine in Detroit. So there are elements on that soundtrack, like the, those were actually um, starlings outside my window. And mm -hmm. I do a lot of work with pitch shifting and granular synthesis. Mm -hmm. So there is probably a kind of slightly surreal echo mm -hmm. effect there. Um, and I have to say, those cicadas were so hard to mix, <laughs> you know? And I think it, it does probably, Chris, you probably know this stuff better than me. It has probably something to come down to the, the actual frequency, but you know, I, I have this strange hearing condition and I'm self-taught when it comes to production. So I found I had to like, you know, send that through the filter of five different people's ears before they're like, no, you got to turn those cicadas down more and more and more to the point where I'm like, wait, but you can't even hear the cicadas anymore to my ears. But I think I think that they are still there and pretty prominent in the soundtrack. Oh, I know it's I'm beautifully mixed. That's what I uh, imagined. I mean, the thing is about when I've recorded cicadas or any 
other grasshoppers, um, crickets. Most of their sound production is in the ultrasonic, so it's beyond our frequency of hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and what we hear is the harmonic fallout. So people hear it differently depending on what the harmonics you're sort of tuned into. So mm -hmm. that's really interesting about you say it almost disappeared. Well, you know, it, 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 I guess it wouldn't, but the, the harmonic content, when you draw it down, has that really sort of added musicality to it, which is a thing that, I, you know, I, I found really, really engaging. I mean, I'm a big, you know, I'm really interested in recording insects sort of around the world. And uh, although there can be few and far between at 55 degrees north where I live, um, but I guess both you and Dave, we, we're um, considering this earlier, you have this sort of eruption of cicadas, don't you? This cycle, 17-year cycle of them. Like a mass, there's supposed to be a mass hatching. Like I think in the South, they're saying like 1.5 million cicadas per square mile. Mm -hmm. so it's just imagining this sort of like mass canopy of, as, as Chris described, sort of drilling almost. Yeah, yeah, from that basho, mm. cicadas drill into the rocks, yeah. yeah. Cicadas are interesting too because I, I have this very distinct sound memory of cicadas from where I grew up, which is probably about two hours away from Detroit is the easiest way to say it, but on the other side of the border in Canada. In my memories of cicadas and that sort of rising sort of lull of cicadas living in a rural area, in Canada was always much different than the cicadas that I hear around Detroit. But this year, it, weirdly, I don't know if it has something to do with the types of cicadas that are around from year to year or, you know, their different life cycles. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. It kind of got back more to that childhood memory of cicadas. Mm. Um, but Chris, you were telling a really fascinating bit of folklore um, about cicadas before we kind of went live. Would you, would you mind sharing that again? Oh, Suzu Mushi. Yeah. <clears throat> which is a, a, a cricket actually, not a cicada, it's a, a bell oh. cricket. It's a, well, it's a tree cricket in, um, in Japan. And they actually be singing now, September, early October is their time. And they have a, um, so these live in trees and they have a very pure tone, so much so that in the 15th and 16th century, the monks in Kyoto said oh. that, Suzumushi, which is a Japanese name for them, has the voice of Buddha. It has this beautiful, pure, bell-like tone. And in fact, they sort of extended it out in the end and they said, oh, well, actually, um, all the animal world has the voice of Buddha. Um, but Suzumushi is this particular, has this particular purity and clarity. So apparently the emperor who lived in Kyoto said, right, okay, so got his his wives, his concubines, to um, carry Suzumushi around with them, around the palace. And so the emperor had these tiny bamboo cages built, a few inches tall, in which Suzumushi was imprisoned and then attached to the kimonos of the emperor's wives. And so as they wafted around the palace, um, so they would carry with them the music of Suzumushi a bit like a sort of 16th century iPod, I guess. Um, and so you know, they would fill the palace with this beautifully pure tone. And Basho, the Japanese poet who wrote about cicadas, the sound of cicadas drilling into the rocks, which is a beautifully eloquent description, also said, loneliness is Suzumushi hanging on the palace wall because that ice poor, isolated, Cricket would sing and sing and sing until it passed away and never find a mate. I love that. That's so great. <laughs> I was re recently watching um, this documentary uh, about Connie Plank, and uh, oh, it, whoa. It, whoa. it's um, yeah, and it's streaming right now. I'd recommend watching it. But it, there's this really eloquent opening of him just like walking through these strange sort of. I think like arcade spaces in Japan, I want to say. I might have that wrong. But anyway, so there's a voiceover and he's talking about, uh, I wrote this quote down because I thought it was just so perfect. Uh, he said, when humans listen into the woods, they listen to noises of animals and there are noises that humans like and there are, human, there are noises that humans don't like. 
and any noise has the potential to be music if humans like it. <laughs> and I thought that's just like, oh, that's so that's perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. send me the link to that. Connie Plank was one of my early sort of heroes uh, with his production of bands like Noi um, yeah. and Cluster, you know, eventually sort of evolved into bands like Kraftwerk. It was sort of the, the German Martin Hanna, you know, it was yeah. brilliant. <laughs> That's interesting what you say about how we think of uh, of sound and, and the musicality of it. There's another, I mean, going back to insects again, because it, it was in my mind, there's a famous um, natural history um, observer. It was, in fact, it was a parson, it was a Christian parson called Gilbert White in the 18th century in the UK. And he described the voices of insects in his very early sort of letters about natural history. And he said, um, sounds do not always give us pleasure by their sweetness and melody, nor do harsh sounds always displease. Which you know, is a sort of a 18th century version of, of his appreciation of the songs of insects, because it is a mechanical sound. That's great about Connie Plank. I mean, that, that, please send me that. because I, I will, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a great thing to draw out. <laughs> no, it is, seriously. I mean, he was such a brilliant producer. And I mean, he's, he's passed away now, but sort of because of the era in the, era in the 70, 1970s, when, you know, it was bands rather than production that was appreciated. He was, uh, I mean, outside Germany anyway, he was overlooked. Yeah, I love the sort of idea of the the rural studio too. You know, he was yeah. like, I think, um, you know, similar to you and I, Chris. He's outside of major cities and just kind of embedded or interested in being embedded in these sort of quiet landscapes. And maybe they're not so quiet. <laughs> That's such a great thing to come across, though, isn't it? It's sort of inspirational. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that really struck me about both films was um, there's a sort of you're in quarantine and you're one part of quarantine I noticed and quarantine is a luxury in a lot of ways and then this thinking outside of yourself and there's an immediacy immediacy to it as well and sort of closing a distance with things that have always been there um things you're noticing that have always been going on and always been happening the sort of right there-ness right right in front of you um and I was wondering if you, if you two if you guys could speak to that a little bit I think Chris, you should you should go first on this oh, one. Okay, I feel well, like the, I took a lot of inspiration from your film. <laughs> the the right now, I mean, you're absolutely right, Dave. Because when we were, I, I came back from I've, I've been trying unsuccessfully to record the song of the largest and loudest animal which has ever lived, which is the blue whale, and I'd been off the coast of Baja California, Loreto, in February, trying to record this animal and failed completely came back and within a couple of weeks of getting back here we were sort of locked down and because like most of us I, you know I, i'm used to sort of traveling a lot i found the first 10 days i mean maggie my partner was saying i was just unbearable you know so sort of um lock, i felt locked up and locked down and then i just looked into our back garden and we live in suburban newcastle upon time northeast england 55 degrees north and then um, we have a very ordinary 100 foot suburban garden 100 foot 100 feet long by about 40 feet and it's it's sort of a wildlife garden because most of the time we're not there so the animals it's their space rather than ours and i just turned into that and because it coincided, the lockdown here in the UK coincided with spring. Uh, and that's when all the birds start singing. So March, certainly from March and into April, everything erupted into song. And then the migrant birds arrived from sub-Saharan Africa. So it became a very sound rich environment. And I, I rediscovered my own back garden, you know, from, from your description. And I started to put microphones out there. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing, you know. I didn't have to go, I didn't have to fly for 11 hours to go somewhere exotic. I just had to tune in to what was on my doorstep. 
and, and I, I heard some of the most amazing sounds, songs, and music that, that you know that I could have imagined. And so that's why, when I was given the opportunity from Unsound to, to make this piece and to make the, the album track, first of all, then I, I thought straight away I need to I need to use what I've been listening to in my back garden because of the techniques that I use, I could put a microphone out. I found, as the film describes, where this where this blackbird was singing from, which is a cypress tree. So I, I contrived to get a microphone as close as possible and run a cable back and, and to my mixer and recorder by the side of my bed, you know. So I could lie in bed. I mean, just how cool is this? I could lie in bed at four o'clock in the morning um, and, and use this bird, this bird, the blackbird would arrive like a, an alarm clock, you know, at sort of four o'clock and just as daylight happened and start to sing. And I was just lying in bed with my headphones on. First of all, I had a loudspeaker. And then after about the first five days, Maggie said, you know, for God's sake, can you turn that bloody thing off? You know, it's waking me up at this time. Anyway, so just I would lay with headphones on and just be transported, even though we were locked down, transported to another place, you know, which is so hard to think about. But then, you know, it fires your imagination uniquely. So I thought I had to include that. And then the whole idea of escaping or being unlocked to another place, which is you know, again, sort of a knowable, this mixture of, of, of land and, and water and sky where these other birds inhabit, just seemed to me a perfect opportunity to, to combine and, and, and connect the two. I really love that sort of sense of like the, you know, the idea of isolation versus the wide sweeping array um, in, in your film, Chris, I thought it was really great of just being able to sort of isolate down um, into, you know, almost straight into the, into the bird's mouth or, or something like that. But um, yeah, I found for me, like, I really had to sort of shift focus in, in how I wanted to do this, the film and the soundtrack versus what was available. And I was in a similar boat of just, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how can I do this in my own backyard? And in a lot of cases, I found I was sort of um, reconstructing, you know, memories of sounds of my hometown because I'm Canadian. Um, I can't cross the border right now. Um, so that kind of puts a huge limitation on, you know, being able, I'm very much a person who likes to go and get site specific sound. And um, even down to, I have this strange analog synthesizer set up uh, that Dave and I have you know, jokingly kind of called the dirt synth um, because I have these sort of patch cables that I can lead out and literally, you know, generate these sort of quasi samples from soil and dirt. Oh, and wow. I, I had this sort of idea that like, oh, I need to go, you know, to my ancestral homelands in, in Wisconsin where the Wendat, um, you know, tribal nation was and um, go back to my hometown and get some samples of the cornfields and things like this. Um, but what I end up doing, and, and this has kind of become a natural thing for me at this point, I guess, in my work is I end up doing a lot of um, reconstruction based on sounds that I'm actually getting, but then also just sort of using these visual cues that are often scraped off of YouTube, you know, trying to find these fragments of things that become strung together in these hopefully poetic ways <laughs> where they're they, these sort of overlaps that kind of work to amplify each other. Um, so I was kind of trying to play with that idea of the echo being a, a literal and metaphorical and a sort of like folkloric thing um, through this film. Um, and I, I think your work, it does similar things in similar ways, minus the YouTube. <laughs> you know, I, you're, I was joking with Dave, you know, it, it, I, um, but when we were sort of planning the session out, it's like, oh, when I first heard what you're up to, it's like, oh, wow, he's, he, Chris is getting to record how I'd hoped to record for this. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think there's been sort of a boom almost in ambient music, not that there ever hasn't been a strong, you know, um, genre there, but you know, there's a lot of, there's been sort of a boom in people like who are privileged enough, I suppose, you know, paying more attention to their environments as they're in 
lockdown, um, thinking of the documenting sound uh, tape series that um, Boomcat has been doing. And um, I think all of us are just gathering as much sound as we can as these memory placeholders. Look, Kristen, before we go any further, myself and like everybody who's listening wants to know more about your dirt synthesizer. <laughs> So uh, we, we need some details on that. Please. Unfortunately, it's like sitting over here and I can't turn my camera, but um, really it's it's like a filter um, that a, uh, um, a filter maker based out of Berlin made. Um, and it's sort of, it's really just a pretty simple analog synthesizer setup. I've got, you know, no, granular. No, it's not. It's, it, sound, it sounds amazing. It's not simple. Just can't we see it? <laughs> can't we see it? Well, um, I can drop a link to um, okay. my website uh, where I've got some samples that you can hear of sonified um, dirt from a site of apparent poltergeist haunting. Whoa. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in actually a couple of years ago at Unsound, I showed a film called The Hum that I did that is based around the infrasound event, The Hum. There's a big one in Detroit. Um, which interestingly stopped during lockdown because guess what? The factory that was supposed to be producing it um, went silent and suddenly the hum disappeared. Wow, wow. Um, so I, for that soundtrack, I actually used that synthesizer to sort of sonify dirt samples and salt um, from the salt mines around here. So some folks who have been at Unsound in the past may be familiar with that. But, uh, but yeah, I'll drop some links um, somewhere. in the, the, the salt mines in Krakow. No, um, there are salt mines that run all underneath Detroit and Windsor also, but I do miss those salt mines in Krakow. I have very lovely memories of seeing Lucretia Dalt um, and being lulled in a very positive and um, not offensive way to sleep, listening to her set while sitting in a chair in the salt mine. Mm. And it was like one of the most palpable live shows I'd ever been to, just the smell down there and the ride down in the rickety sort of carriage <laughs> yeah it's quite a trip isn't it I'm, i think we went to see terry riley that was the last time i was down there a couple of years ago yeah oh yeah well i'd love to i'd love to hear more about that please send me a link to that uh, and the poltergeist stuff i mean that's <laughs> no seriously that's amazing amazing i'd love to hear some more about that i was, I was going to ask is there a sort of a dampness that helps with in maintaining the soil samples or dry is better for transducing or? Yeah, dry is definitely better, um, but it, you know, the soil makeup changes how the distortion sounds just because yeah. of, you know, if there's more limestone or there's more uh, magnetic particles. Um, I did gather a soil sample um, from a poltergeist site uh, in, in Miami and there's a little bit more uh, of a sort of like magnetic resonance to that. And ironically, um, for Dave Tompkins, who's currently writing a really amazing book about Miami bass and many other things, uh, that soil just weirdly enough sounded more bassy. <laughs> so, but uh, and yeah. how, how uh, Christian, how do you sonify that? Uh, so there's just like, you know, um, like analog synthesizer sort of quarter inch patch cables that lead out from the synthesizer and you can like plug it directly oh, okay. uh, it. into the yeah. ground or I have these little like things, these little plastic things that you can sort of plug into. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so at some point I might revisit the echo making soundtrack and try to get, try to weave. Mm -hmm. It feels honest to try to weave some of my hometowns. Um, actual literal granular, you know, soil level sounds into that. So, um, so maybe it's a sketch for now. Yeah, no, please do. I mean, I was really interested in that aspect of your film. In fact, it's a, a deeply sort of personal story, but the evolution from your discovery of your, of, of your roots and your background, your cultural connections mm -hmm. from then, I mean, until now, until sort of contemporary times, I think it was one of the really powerful things about the film. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely like a constant, constant evolution. Um, you know, and it's, <laughs> my family is a little bit less cagey about it now, but it was also one of those things that was just literally always there, you know, and um, one thing I've been really grateful 
or if one can be grateful for a pandemic in whatever awful way that just might have come off. Um, <laughs> one of the things that's been interesting is I've actually was invited to become part of an indigenous feeding circle, which happens virtually. So I'm able to sort of connect with other people in my community and sort of try to recover some of the the um, sort of lost craft ways and things like that. So um, I don't know if I can do this on camera, but um, so I actually I made some some bootleg unsound merch. Uh, cool. <laughs> and this is a traditional <laughs> traditional nice. beaded uh, unsound mm -hmm. logo, and you can probably see the the bill of the hat a little bit better. But yeah, so this is this is my handmade uh, Carhartt hipster Detroit bootleg. <laughs> on sound merch <laughs> but um yeah sorry i'm 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 being uh fascistous now but <laughs> but yeah no it is it was really fantastic to get to explore that and um but chris i think your film too you know there's i feel like there's this interesting connection between our two films of like mm. this sort of underlying sense of like I don't know, there's like a melancholy and a sense of mourning almost like a, you tell the story of the kitty wakes, um, which originally I thought were waves, but as it turns out they're birds. Um, I thought they were like wave wakes. Um, okay, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. But I love the story of, you know, the, their calls being the sort of calls of children who have passed on. Mm. And there's a lot of interesting folklore. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I'd love to talk to you more about that. It's, um, I mean, particularly since you've got this, one of the best titles I've ever heard, a sonic folklorist. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll remember that. Um, it's right, when I, I, I go to Dunstanbury, Maggie and I go to Dunstanbury quite often because it's a really good place to have a walk and it's, it's, it's less than an hour's drive from where we are. Um, but there's always this strangeness about it because it has this layers of time, and so which which is outside of the my you know an hour experience of time cultural and culturally as well because the the rocks on which Dunstanbury are built the, the, this basalt uh, is appeared apparently like three hundred million years ago and merely a thousand years ago. John of Gaunt built Dunstanbury Castle on top of these foundations. Um, and now we go there in the 21st century and, and the birds are still there as, as they have been before the castle was built, certainly. They've been there since before the last ice age, 10,000 years ago. But the, the castle, which is only 1,000 years old, and built of sandstone is now starting to erode and disappear. Whereas the rocks of, of this um, basalt, this volcanic rock, hasn't budged, you know, in 300 million years. Uh, and the scratch marks on it are around, around the foundations of the castle, which a geologist pointed out to me, and she was describing these finger marks. And she said, they're the marks left when the last ice age retreated, which is 10,000 years ago. And, and nothing's changed for those rocks since then. So that sense of deep time, something which is really beyond my understanding anyway. But, you know, literally you can connect by it by standing on those rocks. And um, it's, it's, it's hard to articulate, hard for me anyway, to articulate, but it's deeply powerful. And then that connection with the birds and the voices and, and how people have interpreted that. Local, the local fishing communities, the small villages, Craster and Dunstanborough and Embleton up that part of the coast, you know, they, they found a way of mourning lost children, which must have, you know, and we forget that because we, we're disconnected from that. There would have been so much more uh, um, centuries ago because people lived from the sea and, and worked on and off the sea on the coast. And that idea of explaining what had happened, particularly to children, you know, with very high infant, infant mortality, that they've passed away into these birds, I think was perhaps one form of, of comfort, but beautifully described and, and represented by those voices, those onomatopoeic voices, kitty wake, kitty wake. That's fantastic. One of, one of the 
um, sections in, that didn't make it into my final essay for the unsound book. And I was hoping to insert it into the film, into echo making, but then it just kept getting away from itself in terms of, of length. So I, I'd like to revisit this, but um, I wrote about, and then had to cut out a whole section on the folklore of Mount St. Helens um, in Washington here oh, in the wow. US, uh, which of course in 1980, um, had a cataclysmic eruption, as a lot of people who, you know, grew up in our time period might might remember. Um, so we're seeing that on the news. But there's this uh, lake that was wiped out in the sort of landslide called Spirit Lake, and it was a very charged place um, and has a lot of really fascinating indigenous folklore surrounding it. Uh, and there are these uh, apparent creatures that <laughs> that sort of inhabit the area, um, actually all of Oregon and Washington, um, these sort of creatures are, are found in. There are these sort of hairy, smelly creatures that are almost like Bigfoot-like um, that are known as the Siatko. Um, and they're also called the Night People, which is fantastic. Wow. Wow. Um, but uh, they've been around, you know, for many, many centuries. and um, there are these great stories about how they communicate through whistling and they throw rocks at people's houses and they steal children. Um, so there's all these sort of sonic effects um, that have bled in through the folklore uh, down through the centuries. Um, but when the cataclysmic uh, explosion happened at Mount St. Helens in 1980, it obviously changed the landscape and it sent all these uh, sort of lava tubes down just below the surface of the earth which of course, when they're raked by the wind, make these whistling and moaning oh, sounds. Okay. So now today, a lot of people who hike up in that area think they're hearing the sounds of the, the Siatko. Um, so apparently it's a very uh, ominous place to be at night. And one day when I'm able to travel again, I fully hope to, to go there with some high powered microphone arrays and <laughs> hopefully catch some whistles. So. God, I'd love to hear that, Christian. <laughs> Going back to the lake, what do you, what do you think? Uh, so you said it's sort of a highly charged place area. How, how would you engage with that? What does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I'm always big on sort of honoring, you know, people's stories of folklore as being at least considered to be reality. I'm, you know, as someone who trained as a folklorist, I'm, you know, I might jokingly say there are these smelly, hairy, Bigfoot like creatures, but, you know, maybe there is some basis in reality of some type of animal form people have been seeing there, or maybe it is a sort of spiritual understanding of a landscape. Um, I think that there's always at least some partial truth in the sort of contagion effects that happen through um, folklore. So I'd definitely be interested in, in tracking stories. Um, sadly, Ursula K. Le Guin, the, the science fiction writer, um, she actually went to Mount St. Helens quite a few times and uh, did some studies there and wrote a little bit about, uh, not the Seattle, but about her sort of experiences there. So um, she's kind of a hero. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I definitely, uh, I'm looking forward to traveling at some point. It's definitely an involving project, but there might be a part two of echo making in the future i'm not sure um uh, that's interesting because one of the things that inspired me in the 1980s when <clears throat> actually the time when i made my first record for touch was a writer called tom lethbridge who was a, a an english academic well in fact he was keeper of antiquities at the museum uh, of archaeology in cambridge right in the 1930s and he wrote really beautiful, a whole series of books about the sort of magnetism of places and yeah. the, the spirit and sense of place of different environments. And that's something that I, it, sort of when in the mid 1980s, late 1980s, sort of went and discovered for myself in Northumberland where I live. Um, and they were attached to the old place names of places, of, of mm -hmm. sites where the site might have changed, but in quite often in English Ordnance Survey maps, the names remain and reflect the history of the place. So, for example, briefly, there's a, a, um, a place just north of where I live called Kielder Forest, 
which is a forestry commission. It's a planted forest. And it was planted after the First World War when there was a demand for timber. And it was planted on moorland, on traditional ancient moorland, which hadn't been farmed or, or used much at all. But the place names, which are still there and they're now covered in forest, reflect what happened there. So there's places like Murder Clough, Hangman's <laughs> Rock, Bloody Bush, you know, where you can only imagine what happened in those places, which is now densely forested. forested. But Lethbridge suggested that powerful events in history and, and the lake that you mentioned might be one of them, that something happens there it is recorded, is stored within the landscape. And it's possible to pick that up, to tune into it and possibly record it. Yeah, which is why the first record I made for Touch was called Stepping Into the Dark after one of Lethbridge's books called The Step in the Dark, which is about this idea of attempting for us contemporary society to tune into these places sort of to tap into it yeah. so that got a real strong resonance with what you described in that those places and as it turns out i really like lethbridge's work also so okay, <laughs> um, right. it's uh, probably yeah so a mutual interest there for sure but uh, yeah it might say helen's too you know a lot of times in this work i'm doing right now it's a lot about getting back to honoring the indigenous place naming of things, which often does reveal a lot. Mount St. Helens is essentially like a colonization effect, um, you know, naming a, a mountain in honor of somebody who, you know, from England that never visited the site. Yeah. But if you get yeah. back to the indigenous name of, of <clears throat> Mount St. Helens typically being called Lou Wit, which actually in a lot of uh, languages translates into Lady of Fire, or, you know, so it kind of gives a hint of what that, you know, um, that particular mountain and its volcanic activity had in, in previous times. And there are sort of records reaching back hundreds of years of um, different tribes from that area describing, um, you know, pretty cataclysmic uh, volcanic activity in the area. So it's interesting. And in point of record too, I actually, uh, if we're talking place names, I um, grew up on the outskirts of a little town called Pancour, which if you get back to the French Canadian, uh, translates into short of bread. <laughs> so it was actually named after a famine. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a complicated place still. <laughs> so. It comes out, it came up in, in your, your film as, as well with the, the history of Belle Isle and the sort of colonization and the origins of, of that place which I thought, I thought was really powerful. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a little bit of like what chicken before the egg, like was it called Rattlesnake Island before mm -hmm. the rattlesnakes were placed there? And you yeah. know, the, the sort of more recent history is generally what most Detroiters um, think of, of Belle Isle and not also realizing the sort of complications of history connected to that naming. And people are becoming more aware of the problematic nature of Lewis Cass. Um, who was like a slave owner and, um, you know, responsible for a lot of really horrendous um, activity with indigenous populations in this area. Um, so there is sort of like this embedded melancholiness in, in these landscapes that sometimes you can trace back to, um, you know, this sort of understanding the, the indigenous naming of these things, but um, yeah. The, the, the idea of indigenous folklore is uh, protecting the landscape in ways with uh, <clears throat> some of the stories and in, in indigenous storytelling with Creek Native Americans in East Florida near <clears throat> near St. Augustine and the, the legend of a, a lizard with horrendous breath uh, protecting <laughs> the cave and some of the minerals inside the cave to, to guard it from exploitation mm. by, by uh, Spanish. Uh, so I thought that, that was really interesting. There's a, a long, like pretty a rich lineage of of that storytelling and but how it applies to fact and history yeah um seems like maybe we need to do some sound recording at this lizard breath cave yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i am um, uh, 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 um well probably more than 10 years ago i was in new zealand um and i went to a place uh we, i was there for working on a film a wildlife film about fungus gnats, which are essentially these silkworms 
which hang inside these caves, a place called Waitomo, and they hang a silken thread. And then moths fly into this silken thread and get entrapped and devoured by these um, these caterpillars of these moths. But the, the people who I was with, you know, I was talking to them about my interest in sound, and they took me to a place nearby, <clears throat> which is called the Voice of the Spirit Cave. Mm. And it was a limestone cave, um, a whole sequence of caves, um, and, and miles down into the cave system was a river. And this is my explanation of it. And it pumped, the sound of the river pumped air out up through the cave, a bit like a, a resonator, Helmholtz resonator. And, and what the Maori used to do was stand at the mouth of this cave and ask a question of their ancestors. And then they would take two or three steps forward until they hit the node of this cave and listen to the reply. Because what would happen at the mouth of this cave without destroying the myth was that this infrasound, these very low frequency pulses from the river channeling down the cave system would pour out woo, 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 like that out of the cave. So they would ask a question and then step into the focal point and, and receive their answer, which was just such a beautiful you know, um, connection with landscape. That's I remember that was one of the first notes after after our visit to the mausoleum had Chris Watson that said base cave. Ask him about the base cave <laughs> okay. and, and uh, cave breath. Um, but yeah, I love that story. Yeah, there's a lot. It's interesting. It's, I mean, it's reflected there. Is what I was talking about very early, and you know, totally isolated cultures come to very similar conclusions. So, and, and when that happens, you know, as Kristen and I have experienced, then there's, you can't deny that, you know, that there's, um, it's a reality. And quite often that folklore is, is eventually, you know, reflected in scientific fact, mm -hmm. as they like to call it. You know, it doesn't, you know, folklore is still factual in that sense. You should, I'm not doing a commercial for them, Christian, but there's a label in the UK, a very small label called the Devon Folklore Tapes. Oh, yeah, yeah, I love oh, that right, label. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've, I've got a lot of their stuff here. Yeah, they're really just great design, great. Yeah, they mm. always put out these really fantastic thematic tapes. Um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of their work, as well as, you know, Touch has released some interesting things over the years, your work included. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks. We actually, we have a question uh, from, from Niles Mo um, for Kristen. And he's asking about the uh, contagion effects of folklore, if it'd be possible to expound on that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the simple, I, so uh, I actually went to folklore school, but I still don't really have a good way. The, the simplest way of sort of, you know, explaining this is just like the idea of like the telephone game of like, you know, um, whispering a thing and then it sort of like begins to echo and uh you know echo out into society and morph and change and that's what i really love about um folklore is the sort of changeability of it and how it sort of inserts its way into these little nooks and crannies um last year around this time i was in london go figure imagine that we could travel uh <laughs> and uh i gave a talk at the white chapel gallery called they were there when the noise started uh and did a little session for um bbc actually with elena uh chance and jennifer lucy allen um and uh, it was called voices contagion so i'm not sure if that's available online still anywhere but i kind of went into it a little bit there um, I tend to look at it from a very sort of uh, technological standpoint a lot these days, where um, I'm really obsessed with this uh, text-to-speech synthesizer from the 19, I say 1980s, but actually I think it's, it's more like the 1960s when this thing was made in Detroit, um, is the synthesizer called the Votrax, uh, type and talk, and you don't know it, but you if you listen to electronic music, you've definitely, I guarantee, heard craft work, which means that if you've heard craft work, you've heard the Votrax. Um, and it's in uh, numbers and uh, music nonstop, uh, 
techno pop, a couple a couple other tracks too. But um, basically, what happened is this sort of <laughs> contagion effect of technology and folklore all coming together uh, in Detroit. Uh, Florian Schneider was here on tour, liked you know artificial voices, and found out about this Vaux tracks, which was made in this guy Richard Gannion's basement. Um, and then it kind of just like exploded out into the world because the, the chip that this was made on the SCO one just kind of began to permeate the technology of the 1980s. If you've ever played Qbert in an arcade, you've heard the voice of the Votrax when Qbert dies and swears. Um, <laughs> it's, it's made its way into a lot of video games too. So, um, so yeah, I have the, an interest in sort of like very traditional folklore, but then I'm really all about sort of extending that into um, slightly more, um, I guess, close to the bone technologies. So I guess that would be my sort of rambling, maybe impenetrable spiel on <laughs> G contagion effects and folklore. Um, There's an excellent chapter on the Votrax in your book that I, I referred the Ganyans to. <laughs> And various uh, text to text to see uh, text to see sorry text to speech uh, sent uh, advocates out there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Chris, I, I was gonna I was gonna ask you about just the the acoustics of those uh, three hundred million year old rocks in recording in the Kitty Hawk not the Kitty Hawks Kitty Wakes mm -hmm. and and I guess it's the separation of of the signaling from the birds and their cries, but also the sea spray, you know, <clears throat> the, the ocean itself and that crash. Um, I, yeah, I really like that. I think, um, I mean, if, as I understand it, and you know, I'm not a scientist or a bio, bioacoustician, but a lot of birds and other animals that live in sort of let's say sort of noisy situations like close to sea cliffs or rivers in particular um, their voices evolve to cut through that that sound so there's a bird which occurs in Europe and and the US called a dipper a, a bird of fresh water which its voice has evolved to cut through the sound of running water um, which is an amazing development you know i mean it's not happened overnight obviously this is evolution so it's happened over hundreds of thousands of years but i'm sure kitty wakes have the same thing the interesting thing for that is in multiple voices individual birds can identify each other you know their voices are coded in a way you know which i hope we'll never understand or or you know but but there's a connection there and the acoustic plays a part of that and the thing, one of the things that interests me about where I made those recordings on those sea cliffs, and it's in some of the shots in the film, is that eventually, after millions of years, when those rocks do erode and fall into the sea, they form these boulders, which can be anything from sort of pebble size to car-sized boulders, but they become smoother than smoothed and rounded by the incessant passage of the tides and they start to knock together and, and because it's black the, this basalt is jet black when it's wet they shine and they're called Dunstanborough diamonds even though they're these huge rocks and they knock together and if you use hydrophones I didn't I didn't go into this in the film but if you put hydrophones near those rocks as the tide comes in you can hear this amazing sort of knocking sound which vibrates all across that part of the shoreline so it's this strange uh, underwater sort of musical accompaniment and those cliffs are also very rich in seabirds so the thing that interests me about that place um, again outside of the film is that the soundscape is vertical because it, uh, seabird cliffs are like a real seabird city and they're, they're, they're occupied 24 hours a day in the breeding season. So it's, but there's a hierarchy. It starts with birds, but sea level. And then they, the species change as, the, um, as you increase the altitude of them. And, so, and each one have their particular voices, which seem, appear, appear to have evolved respective to the sounds of the ocean. 
So there's, there's this sense of like a vertical soundscape, which I find really interesting. Um, you know, whether you're ascending or descending through it. And it's places, you know, a bit like some of the stuff that some of the places that Christians describe, they're endlessly fascinating and engaging, but they're completely unknowable. And that's what I like about that. You know, mm-hmm. we I don't try and understand that. I just I just enjoy being in those places and part of it. Yes, one one thing with with the pandemic and, and listening that and I think something something we had talked about was that the birds weren't necessarily signaling, signaling louder. It's more, more like humans were forced to pay attention and pay attention and in a lot of ways, <clears throat> going, going back to that immediacy. And, and I remember in May where the birds were replaced by helicopters uh, <laughs> hovering, hovering in place, this sort of enforced... Uh, pattern of noise and control above when the, when the protests and the George Floyd protests and Breonna Taylor mm, protests mm. were happening. So, and then the, and the helicopters were always there even when there weren't protests, uh, just as to ingrain it in, in the memory and that sort of control. And I, and I remember it even, <clears throat> and I, I met with a, a guy, uh, Nasheen Dorch, who led, led one of the marches through, through Red Hook, a member of the, the New Black Leaders. And we're sitting on this canopy of willow oaks and there are these sweeping cicadas that sort of provided this sort of filtering for that kind of blocked out the helicopters in a way. And, and for a moment, there was sort of a sort of a, a piece in there. Um, and I thought that that was interesting with, with both your works that this sort of the evolution of what was happening when, when you were in quarantine and then and then when you, when it was unlocked, or in Kristen's case, like <clears throat> recording the uh, the morning in the memorial on Bell Island, um, and I thought that that trace how that sort of like how that how the timelines had become totally askew in our sense of time, and I thought that was that was both captured really well in both your works. I think as things were unfolding here in Detroit, I was feeling like just so much profound frustration of not being able to physically, you know, go out to a protest. Uh, I have an autoimmune disorder, so I've been on pretty hard lockdown over here. So kind of contributed in whatever ways I could from afar without physically going. Um, But um, yeah, and also I'm not a citizen of the United States. So, um, you know, the sort of uncertainty of some of the protests sort of turning you know, a little violent or, or not violent, and the randomness of that potential, um, potentially getting arrested, deported. <laughs> uh, wow, wow. You know, that's sort of like another whole layer, but um, going um, at the end of Echo Making, there's some footage that I shot out on Bell Isle. Um, well, there's some, some found footage of a protest moving across the MacArthur Bridge, which is this big, huge, long bridge that leads out to Bell Isle. And that was an interesting protest because it was completely silent, um, which you know uh, was this very active um, sort of decision to make that protest silent. And that was one of the first protests in the city. Um, but then uh, at the end of May, I was leaving this sort of placeholder gap at the end of my film because I knew there was going to be this memorial out on Belle Isle for the victims of COVID um, where people could submit family photographs of, um, you know, loved ones that had passed um, from the disease. And um, I don't know really what I was expecting. I mean, I knew it was going to be gutting and very sad. Um, But when I actually sort of arrived at the island, you you weren't allowed to get out of your car. So you're in your car and there was a radio station that you could tune into that had sort of selected um, music, just being confronted physically with something outside of digital space, something that was in this embedded within this landscape as a continuation of this sort of narrative of Belle Isle. Um, it was it was like, I'm not like a super emotional person, but I got super weepy um, just seeing all this as one should. And I think that anyone who has any sort of disbelief uh, in the pandemic, if they need to confront things like that more often, um, you know, sort of seeing faces that I recognized, um, both mm. literally and metaphorically, you know, this is, this is a visual representation of 
the city of Detroit and the people who are here, you know, seeing seeing Mike Huckabee, who you know, I'm sure folks who attend Unsound uh, might know Mike Huckabee is a, a very essential uh, techno DJ here, and he died from COVID complications. And sort of seeing his face on one of these posters driving through um, Belle Isle was just like, uh, you know, and it felt important. It, I wasn't trying to be like a vulture taking photographs at a funeral, but it felt really important to document um, this event. Um, so similarly, very strange sonic effects of, of all of this, as well as just like these sort of further complications and embedments of you know, these landscapes. Um, yeah. I thought that was really powerful conclusion to, to your film, Christian, because you brought it up, you know, totally up to date. And you, you know, you started off with a reference to your, um, you know, cultural past and then brought it up to date with those images, which were, which were really powerful. But for me, because I don't, you know, I mean, I looked at the, the people illustrated in those in the pictures. And of course, I, you know, I never had the privilege of knowing them, but it, so I, it was really sort of life affirming to me. But you know, so it was really quite a powerful conclusion in that sense, um, because it, you know, I don't know those people, but it referenced the mm -hmm. fact that people that I know that have, you know, that haven't come through this. And so that was a really beautiful evocation, I think, of time that you, you, you created through your film and composed it through the images, but, you know, principally through your narration as well from okay. the past right up to date whereas mine was sort of a return to sort of deep time you know very very deep time pre-human time when those birds were there right so. there's so much poetry in <laughs> in the practicality of of just seeing the types of technologies that you use to best sort of capture those spaces too though but, um... yeah i mean well, that, was, that was what matt asked me to do for himself he said i wanted like to it was like it has to be sort of walk through workshop so I did as I was told. <laughs> I don't often do that, but I did, I did for Matt and Gosha. Well, we're very lucky that um, Unsound was able to find a way to continue this year. I think we'd all yeah. much rather be at the hotel forum or riding down in a slightly terrifying rattly lift down into a salt cave <laughs> to fall asleep at a, a, a gig like me. <laughs> which is a thing I tend to do for some reason. It's, it's not meant to be offensive. It's just, yeah, I get sucked up into it. But um, it, it's really special that um, all the programming that's gone on this year, there's been some really fantastic panels. Um, there's so many that I haven't watched yet, but the machine listening sessions have been amazing. Um, and uh, Luke Turner um, yeah. led up a really fascinating yeah. panel on uh, nature a couple of days ago that I'm still just have all these things spinning through my head. And, um, anyone who's watching this who hasn't checked those things out, I um, highly encourage you to go back and check out Unsound's YouTube channel too. Yeah, we, I got to go over to Warsaw for the ephemera sets. I, I did a, we did a Chernobyl live set with Hilda and Sam and um, Teresa and, and Francesco in, in, in Warsaw, which was amazing. So yeah, at least we got the chance to go over. Yeah. Look, I'm going to have to go. I mean, I think my casserole will about be ready now. I know Maggie will be chomping at the bit as well. So yeah. from my point of view, I, sh I think I should wrap it up. Yeah, it's I think, been I such think... a pleasure, Kristen and Dave. Yeah, to, and likewise, I think... Thank you both. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Unsound. Um, yeah. I know uh, I'm going to hop over into the Discord uh, ballroom, I think is where I'm supposed to go. Uh, I'm going to go over to Discord for like half an hour or so and just float around and see if anyone has any um, follow-up questions. But um, it's been a pleasure um, to talk to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, thanks, Matt and Gosha. And I'll be, I'll be around in the, uh, in the Discord room for a little bit as well. But yeah, that was great. I really enjoyed listening. Such a pleasure. Cheers, Kristen. Cheers, Dave. Thanks, Bye. Everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.